Recently, I was invited to be a guest on Hitman 9801's channel. Now, Hitman is an incredible guy. He has a deep knowledge of English history and culture and put together an amazing story and stream where he went through and presented and we got to do some commentary on the history of the Anglo-Saxon Chronicles. There's an incredible amount that we covered from the kings of the era, the important figures, the migrations, the battles, the pivotal events that forged the English people. And we ended up discussing some fascinating topics from the ethnogenesis of the English to the history of how the Vikings and the Danes interacted with the kingdoms of the era. We broke this up into two streams, into two different parts at the time, but we decided to put this together as one full show to present to you so that more people can get a chance to listen to this great series of episodes. And I want to encourage all of you to be able to go check out Hitman's channel where he has a bunch of content that's very similar to this. And he is an incredible guy to listen to because he's got this amazing way of presenting this deep knowledge in a way that's easy to grasp, but also exciting and invigorating. So with that being said, I hope you enjoy this show that we had together and please drop a like, go to Hitman's channel, go follow him, and we'll see you guys at the end. Hello, good evening. Uh, tonight I bring you a discussion on the Anglo-Saxon Chronicles. Uh, I'm very lucky to be joined by my guest here, Nord Hugo. Uh, how are you this evening, sir? Hey, doing well. Thank you so much, Hitman, for inviting me on. This is going to be a lot of fun. Yes, absolutely. And um, so just regarding the, uh, the Anglo-Saxon Chronicles themselves, so um, when did you first sort of re read or hear about it? You know, I couldn't tell you, to be honest, the first time that I heard about them. Uh, it might have been from reading up on, on some other books and had seen that the Anglo-Saxon Chronicle was being referenced a bunch. So about two years ago, I just went on Amazon, picked up a copy. Uh, the translation I have is the 1823 and 18, a mix of an 1823 and 1847 translation by James Ingram and Dr. J.A. Giles. And yeah, it's, it's really a fascinating book just because, or a series of books, kind of like a Bible of sorts of, of Anglo-Saxon history. It's just incredible because of how much, like the breadth and the detail that it covers. Um, yes, yeah, certainly, because um, it goes all the way from Julius Caesar's um, landing in Britain in 60 BC, all the way up into the accession of um, King Henry II in the, uh, the 12th century. So it's a rather huge, broad um, sweep through um, early medieval um, English history. Um, me personally, um, I was aware of the Chronicles for many years because I've always found um, Anglo-Saxon history fascinating. But when I was younger, I tend to read more secondary material than primary primary material. Um, I think that was mainly because a lot of primary material has a more archaic writing style, which I found a bit off-putting. But as I've matured, I've come to appre appreciate it more. So I actually um, read the Chronicles for the first time the end of last year. And um, my copy was actually a pretty modern edition that was only um, printed in 2022. Excellent. Yeah. Did you find when you were reading it, because it seemed to me as I was going through that parts of it would be incredibly gripping with so many things happening at once and then and then it would slow down and then you get the annual records and you'd just see, OK, so and so Archbishop died at this year and then the Abbey uh, received gold at this year and their the crops fared this well and then you get huge stretches where basically you know peacetime where nothing would happen and then suddenly you'd see this incredible gem of some some fascinating bit of history kind of pop up throughout i mean what was your what was your moment to moment reading experience like um yeah i think it's about about the same you have the gripping events and then you have the, uh, the not so gripping events um over that the expression that comes to mind um there are um there are years where days happen and there are days when years happen. I think that's very true of the Anglo-Saxon oh, Chronicles. Totally. 
<laughs> yeah, it, it does feel very much though like essential reading for just to get to the primary source of this history. No, absolutely. Um, well, I would be remiss if I didn't mention um, another um, major source of Anglo-Saxon history, which is um, Bede's Ecclesiastical History of the English People, which is I also read around the same time as um, the Anglo-Saxon Chronicles. That's also a very wonderful and, in fact, very cosy read. Um, a bit different because it was written significantly earlier, um, so it doesn't quite cover the same stretch of history, but what it does cover is much more um, in, in depth. Um, so have you, have you read that at all, or...? I haven't. Uh, what year was that written in? Uh, Seven thirty-five, from what I recall. Oh, okay, yeah. So, so pre, pre Viking invasions. Mm -hmm. Interesting, yeah. Um, yeah. So, with the ecclesiastical history, um, is good if you want to read again about the early Anglo-Saxon period, especially about how they converted to Christianity and a lot of the infighting in the uh, in the seventh century. Uh, so. Yes, you should definitely read it at some point. It's uh, wonderful. Uh, so I just want to um, move on. I have a presentation up here. So uh, on the front, you see there's an image of what's called the Peterborough Chronicles. So with the um, Anglo-Saxon Chronicles, because uh, it's not just one, uh, there are many of them. So the origin is, is they, were they were believed to have been commissioned by Alfred the Great um, during his reign. Um, and so the reason why he commissioned them is obviously, as you know, in the run up to his reign, um, you have the invasion of the great heathen army where the sons of Ragnar Lothbrok um, were wreaking revenge for the death of their father um, years before. And so they invade, um, they destroy the kingdom of Northumbria, uh, blood eagling King Ayla. They then head south and conquer East Anglia, conquer most of Mercia. And then it's just Wessex being the lone Anglo-Saxon kingdom left to resist the invasion. And so there is this idea of the Chronicles being there to to sort of essentially write down uh, the history of the Anglo-Saxon people. So they would have their own sort of written history to sort of rally around and inspire them. Or what's your thoughts on that? Hmm. Yeah, I mean, I mean, it is pretty pivotal moment there. <clears throat> Indeed, and um, so just going back to the then chronicles. So it, certainly, there would have been one original chronicle, which unfortunately no longer is this that has lives that has been lost to history. Uh, however, uh, on this slide, uh, so on the right hand side, uh, there was a map. Uh, so there were several chronicles written and written and commissioned to different places. So uh, during this time. Um, most of the literate population would have been clergymen, so they were the ones who have actually, would have actually written down the, the um, chronicles themselves. So I mentioned before um, the ecclesiastical history by the Venerable Bede. Well, he himself was a was a priest, a, um, a scholar at um, the priory at Jarrow Weirmouth in the, in Northumbria, as it would have been people like him who would have been commissioning the, these chronicles. And so you can see here that there's Winchester, uh, Worcester, Peterborough. Uh, Abingdon and Canterbury were the main locations, um, which, as I said, they also are made sites of major um, cathedrals in England. So obviously there's Canterbury Cathedral, Winchester, Winchester Cathedral, Worcester Cathedral. Um, and so though these were written by um, clergymen in, in these um, priories, uh, the works themselves have later been moved on and kept um, elsewhere. So you can see there's Oxford, London and Cambridge. So if you go to these places, you can actually um, see the, the the remaining chronicles that, that, that still exist. Mm. And um, here is like a, is a diagram of how, because all the chronicles, they all cover the same events, but obviously as they're written by different people and are using different source materials, they do all vary slightly. Uh, so you can see the original text, then from there you've got um, Asa's Life of Alfred, uh, Athelweird's Chronicle, Annals of St. Neots. So, and as we can see, Annals of St. Neots has no version spring off from there, so that, I believe that may be lost. However, from the original text, you see the Winchester versus the Parker Chronicle, and then there's a copy of that. Then going down, you see all the other versions that have been, been written. So every version that has a, a letter next to it is a surviving version that is still, still around today. 
Hmm. Um, yeah, so um, in your um, translation, does it say if it's based on any of these particular chronicles at all? Or... It's... Uh, it doesn't specify which particular chronicles, but it lays out... It's structured essentially in a year-to-year form drawing from drawing from all of the all of the chronicles that are are still intact from what i understand mm. yeah because my version it doesn't make it clear and, and as i've mentioned before we went live that um there are actually some events for example where there's a passage where it mentions a year and some event or events and then there'll be other passages for the same year that will say the same events, but written slightly differently. So what I suspect mm. the publisher of my version has done is have taken different versions of the same events from different chronicles and just put them all together in the same book. Yeah, mine mine has the exact same thing. So AD 140 has two, trans, or two different versions of it, AD 1041, AD 1043. Uh, so I, especially once you get later into later into the into the timeline you get this doubling up of different versions and accounts of the events and they it's sort of like how the gospels will recount some of the same events but tell them a bit differently although occasionally you do see some contradictions you know certainly because you'll find that some events may mention something where another one another one doesn't so there's a little bit of an inconsistency but i think it's good to have all of it and then you can make your own judgment rather than have something missing by having something omitted yeah no i do like the way they handle it in that giving you the full breadth of it okay so uh here um on this slide uh, I actually have, so in my version, this is the um, contents. And what I've done is I've decided to take a note of how many pages were dedicated to each section and and roughly how much time in history that section covers, because I think that there's an interesting uh, how they've handled it. So you can see that of a book that's nearly 300 pages long, uh, they only dedicate eight pages to Roman Britain, which is a period of nearly 500 years long. So that's... Um, <laughs> Quite an oh, abridged section of history. Oh, uh, that kills me. I, I wish that's what I was when I was going through the readings and going through the the sort of primordial history of Britain pre pre and leading up to the Germanic invasion. I was I was so desperate for more text around that area. So I'll, I'll have to look elsewhere to dig up what I can find from that era, because there's so much that happens there that's kind of shrouded in the mists of time. Mm. Uh, again, going back to the classical history, uh, that book actually does cover the Roman period a bit better than the Anglo-Saxon Chronicle. That's definitely more than eight pages, I can tell you from reading it. <laughs> though, it uh, though it's still not, it's not the bulk of that book, so it's better, but probably still not the best source. Um, a source I probably would recommend looking at, especially if you want, say, the late Roman period, is um, there is um, a work called On the Ruin of Britain by a 6th century monk called Gildas. And um, it, it, that is him, because he was a, it was mostly him sort of ranting and raving about the, the ruin that Britain had fallen into after the Romans had left. And it, it makes everything sound like everything's gone to complete bedlam. So... <laughs> um, if, it's like the the monk version of oh what's yeah have have you seen the documentary about the Chinese that move into that move into the Congo and are looking at the ruins of colonial Africa and are just not, distraught by it? Uh, no, I've not seen that. No, what's it called? There's a there's this sort of classic documentary from. 2010 it's where the it's where the it's also tiresome meme oh right okay and he's just you see this chinese man who's doing all this contracting work with the local africans to build things and he's he's just looking at the state of some of the infrastructure that had been left the railroads the telegraph lines etc from the colonial era and seeing that it had fallen into disrepair and he's just he's just so distraught by it he's sort of like sounds like the 
sixth century monk looking at the Roman ruins and just going, ah, you let it crumble. Look at all this infrastructure, these aqueducts. Oh, sounds uh, fascinating. I should probably give that uh, a watch at some point. Uh, though, uh, coming to my mind, um, have you um, read any Oswald Spengler at all, Lord Hugo? I have, I've heard people quote him, but I haven't read any of it directly. Because in The Man and Technics, um, which is quite a short read if you ever want to read anything by him, um, he does something similar. He's sort of, he's writing in the 30s and he's sort of lamenting how he thinks Western civilization is really in quite sharp, severe decline. And he says, oh, in, in centuries time, you know, all that's going to be left is our skyscrapers and our huge buildings. That's the only thing that we're left to Western civilization. It's all just going to go to ruin, essentially. Hmm. Yeah, you, I mean, you see that so much in post-apocalyptic literature and media. You just see the, the ruins of the skyscrapers covered in vines and decaying. And it's quite an evocative sight. I mean, you can imagine a similar feeling of this sort of almost post, post-apocalyptic living in the ruins feeling of Roman Britain after, after the fall of the empire, after, after they get kicked out. Mm. Yeah, especially certainly if um, you're a native Briton, because they must have felt pretty abandoned after the Romans withdrew and uh, had to deal with the uh, the Saxon menace. So, uh, yes. Yeah, so moving on. So the rest of the section. So a uh, heptarchy. So that starts with the landing of Hengist and Horsa, and then ends just before the first Viking raid on on Lindisfarne. So at forty four pages, that's a bit more in depth, though it's still relatively sparse, I think, compared to um, the Ecclesiastical History by Bede. So again, that's a, a better text, I think, if you want to read about that period. Um, and then when you sort of get to the Viking invasions onwards, you start to get a bit more um, meat and it, things start to get a bit more interesting because um, there are many um, wild battles and um, interesting figures that, that come up. So You get the so blow you... by blow of the yes. campaigns. Mm. Uh, what what's the reason? Uh, I'm not familiar with the word heptarchy. Uh, what what does heptarchy mean? Okay, so uh, the heptarchy was, uh, in fact, let's move forward a page because I've got an image. So, okay, uh, so on these uh, images, this is the evolution of Anglo-Saxon Britain um, throughout. Uh, th- this period. So on the left-hand side, this is around 540 at the time of when Gildas, who I've mentioned before, was writing. So all of the red texts are tribes or areas controlled by Saxons. Uh, the uh, the purpley colour are Jutes and the... No, sorry, so red, red is the Angles. Uh, the, or, the brown colour are Saxons and the purple colour are the Jutes. So, so the Anglo-Saxon peoples are roughly controlled the eastern side of England, whereas the Britons are holding out in the southwest, uh, in Wales, and in and even in, even in the northwest. Um, then going forward into uh, the uh, seventh century, uh, you can see that a bit more is under their control now. They've managed to push into the southwest, but though the counties of Devon and Cornwall there in the southwest are still holding out and would do for centuries while still in the northwest around modern day Lancashire um and um Cumbria um they're still holding out but by the image on the right which would be certainly by the end of the um the 7th century or the 8th century uh, pretty much all of what is modern day England and even some of the lowland Scotland has been, has been taken over by the Saxons and heptarchy so the etymology if we go back to the ancient Greek so hept uh, is seven and archi from arc or uh, essentially a power or so power of seven because after the Saxon uh, power tribes um, had settled themselves by this time that formed into seven distinct kingdoms. So these kingdoms are um, East Anglia, Essex, Kent, Sussex, Wessex, Mercia and Northumbria. So that so it's the seven kingdoms of England. So that's what heptarchy means, essentially. And it was also during this time, um, through the uh, institution of a Wetan Gemot, they would also, the most powerful Anglo-Saxon king would be given this title of uh, Brettwalder or Britain ruler, is what it believes to mean, 
which is sort of an acknowledgement of who was the most powerful of, of the kings. And there would always be a new um, one selected when the old one died. So one example was, um, I don't know if you're aware of King Offer of Mercia, who was one, a very long ruling Anglo-Saxon king in the 8th century. Um, he rules from about 753 and dies in around uh, 796, I believe, just after the raid on Lindisfarne. Um, he was um, one Britain ruler, and he ruled at a time called the Mercian um, Hegemony, which is the time when Mercia was most dominant. Hmm. And he built uh, fortification along the border of Mercy and Wales, isn't that correct? Uh, like a dike yeah. of some sort? Yeah, Offers Dyke, yes. Impressive. I, is that earthwork still around? Um, I believe so. Um, I, I don't think there's a physical structure there, but if you go, I think there's like a, a ridge of land where you can see it's clearly been uh, shaped from something that what that once was there. Hmm. Well, the, certainly the maps are very much appreciated when going through this. I, I always love to kind of get as much of a, a visual understanding of the land and the shifts in territory that are being described. Because, I mean, throughout the course of the Chronicles, I mean, it's it's wild just the extent to which boundaries are, are constantly shifting and changing and new territories being carved out. Yes, certainly. And... Um... The seventh century is particularly wild because, um, but by that point, um, some of the Saxon kings had converted to Christianity, such as um, King Ethelbert of Kent, famously in five nine six, with um, um, Saint Augustine, Saint Augustine of Canterbury, not to be confused with Saint Augustine of Hippo, uh, the author of the City of God, the probably more well known Saint Augustine, um, admission to um, Kent in five five nine six, and also you have. Um, King Serdic, um, who establishes the West Saxons, the Kingdom of Wessex, um, also converts to Christianity in the 6th century. But many other kings, including most notably, um, you've got King Pender of Mercia, um, do not convert. And there are many wars and between these Saxon tribes as they're fighting for supremacy. Uh, and are the... There's actually a couple of segments I do want to read from this heptarchy bit. I'm just going to pull them up. And while you're pulling that up, uh, it's interesting to just, as we're going through the as we're going through the timeline, the Chronicles do a great job of laying out the secession of kings, and they always trace their lineage back to Woden, which is really fascinating. So they have this sort of divine lineage, and even while they're Christian, they're still tracing, they're still tracing their kings back to. Uh, what we would think of as as a pagan god, but in some sense is this great progenitor king. Um, yes, no, no, certainly. I thought that was fascinating. It, so it's an attempt to reconcile the pagan past with the um the, the, the Christian contemporary. Uh, so they're, they're they're acknowledging the new Christian faith, but they're not completely turning their back on their on their past or heritage, which which is which is good. And that's that's something that's extremely similar to what you see in the Prose Edda, in which Snorri Sturluson does a very similar thing by incorporating and you hemorrhizing or histor putting into history the some of these same semi mythological figures of Odin and Thor and Freyr as these progenitor semi divine kings who leave from Troy at the fall of Troy and travel east and north or west and north, excuse me, and create these great lineages and are the the forebears of the modern Nordic nations we see today. But then it also, it, it has this kind of beautiful synchronicity with the same events and the same lineages that are described here. And I'll have to look into this, but correct, correct me if I'm wrong here, but I do recall there being 
some there being some letter that was sent by um dur- during the Roman era by one of the one of the Britons to Rome essentially saying we should have peace because we are both descended from Troy. Now I'll have to check I'll have to check if that's correct, but is that something that you've heard of that letter? Uh yes, I I think I have read that somewhere, but it's not the first time. There are many um people who claim their lineage from, from Troy. Uh, later on you've got um, I think it's William of uh, Monmouth uh, who in his I think it's history of the kings of Britain, he claims that um the origins of the Britons was a, a Prince Brutus from who travelled there after the the, the sack and fall of Troy. So it's something that comes up a, a lot throughout history and, and myth. Ah, no, it is it is this kind of fascinating story. And just that they had the the awareness and considered Troy to be very real. I mean, it's, it's a bit off topic from the broader history, but it does kind of go into the primordial origins of how they viewed themselves, how how the people of the North viewed themselves. No, precisely. And so I've got the passages now. So, okay. So eighty four four nine. This year, Martin and Valentinian assumed the empire and reigned seven winters. In their days, Hengist and Horsa, invited by Vertgern, king of the Britons, to his assistance, landed in Britain in the place that is called Hip's Winesfleet. First of all, to support the Britons, but they afterwards fought against them. The king directed them to fight against the Picts, and they did so, and obtained the victory wheresoever they came. They then sent to the Angles and desired them to send more assistance. They described the worthlessness of the Britons and the richness of the land. They then sent them greater support. Then came the men from free powers of Germany, the old Saxons, the Angles and the Jutes. From the Jutes are descended the men of Kent, the White Warians, that is the tribe that now dwelleth in the Isle of Wight, and that kindred in Wessex, that men yet call the kindred of the Jutes. From the old Saxons came the people of Essex and Sussex and Wessex. From Anglia, which has ever since remained waste between the Jutes and the Saxons, came the East Angles, the Middle Angles, the Mercians, and all of those north of the Humber. Their leaders were two brothers, Hengist and Horsa, who were the sons of Vitgils. Vitgils was the son of Witter, Witter of Wacta, Wacta of Woden. From this Woden arose all our royal kindred and that of the South Humbrians also. AD 449, and in their days, Vortigern invited the Angles thither, and they came to Britain in three churls at the place called Whippet's Fleet. This year, so AD 455, this year, Hengist and Horsa fought with Verpgen the king on the spot that is called Aylesford, his brother Horsa being there slain. Hengist afterwards took to the kingdom of his son Esk. AD 457, this year, Hengist and Esk fought with the Britons on the spot that is called Crayford and there slew 4,000 men. The Britons then forsook the land of Kent and in great consternation fled to London. AD 465, this year, Hengist and Esk fought with the Welsh, nigh Vipt fleet, and there slew 12 leaders, all Welsh. On their side, a fane was there slain, whose name was whipped. AD 473, this year, Hengist and Esk fought with the Welsh and took immense booty, and then the Welsh felt, fled from the English like fire. Uh, that's the end of the bit on Hengist uh, and Horsa. Uh, so, so as you can see there, the first section was quite lengthy, uh, but then all the other little bits are relatively shorter. And um, I, I do like the little um, poetic turn there with them, um, and the Welsh fled from the English like fire. <laughs> <laughs> and you also get just the, the beautiful alliteration with names, so you have Whitgills was the son of Witter, Witter of Wector, Wector of Woden. So it's <laughs> it's just this kind of lovely, lovely language scheme that they have going on. Uh, yes, yeah, so and the next bit I want to read, you see it again with um, King Serdic and his son Sinric, uh, which is okay. So this is so eighty four nine five. This year came two leaders into Britain. Serdic and Sinric his son, with five ships, at a place that is called Serdic's Or, and they fought with the Welsh the same day. Then he died, and his son Sinric succeeded to the government, and held it six and twenty winters. Then he died, and Siolin, his son, succeeded, and who reigned seventeen years. Then he died, and 
Cale succeeded to the government and reigned five years. When he died, Caelwulf, his brother, succeeded and reigned 17 years. The kin go up to Serdic, then succeeded Sinbils, or, or Kinbils, Caelwulf's brother's son, to the kingdom and reigned one in 30 winters. And he, first of West Saxon kings, received baptism. Then succeeded um, Kenwall, who was the son of Kingils and reigned one in 30 winters. Then held Sexberger, his queen, the government one year after him. Then succeeded Exwine to the kingdom, whose kin grew up to Serdic and held it two years. Then succeeded uh, Kentwine, the son of King Gilles, to the kingdom of the West Saxons and reigned nine years. Then succeeded uh, Kedwall to the government, whose kith go to Serdic and held it for three years. Then succeeded Ina to the kingdom of the West Saxons, whose kin go to Serdic and reigned 37 winters. Then succeeded Ethelherd whose kin go to Serdic and reigned 16 years. Then succeeded Cuthred, whose kin go to Serdic and reigned 16 winters. Then succeeded um, Sigebret, whose kin go to Serdic and reigned one year. Then succeeded Kin Kinwolf, whose kin go to Serdic and reigned one in 30 winters. Then succeeded uh, Britric, whose kin go to Serdic and reigned 16 years. Then succeeded Egbert to the kingdom and held it seven in 30 winters and seven months. Then succeeded Ethelwolf, was the son of Egbert, Egbert of Aelmund, Aelmund of Etha, Etha of Ioppa, Ioppa of Ingild, Ingild of Senrid, Inner of Kenrid, Cuthberger of Kenrid, and Quenberger of Senrid, Kenrid of Caerwald, Caerwald of Cuthwolf, Cuthwolf of Cuthwine, Cuthwine of Kelm, Kelm of Kinric, Kinric of Creoda, Creoda of Serdic. Then succeeded Ethelbald, the son of Ethelwolf, to the kingdom, and held it five years. Then succeeded Ethelbert, his brother, and reigned five years. Then, then succeeded Ethelred, his brother, to the kingdom and held it five years. Then succeeded Alfred, their brother, to the government, and then has al elapsed his age three and twenty winters, and 396 winters from the time when his kindred first gained the land of Wessex from the Welsh. And he had held the kingdom a year and a half, less than 30 winters. Then succeeded Edward, the son of Alfred, and reigned 24 winters. When he died, then succeeded Athelstan, his son, and reigned 14 years and seven weeks and three days. Then succeeded Edmund, his brother, and reigned six years and a half, wanting two knights. Then succeeded Edred, his brother, and reigned nine years and six weeks. Then succeeded Edwy, the son of Edmund, and reigned three years and 36 weeks, wanting two days. When he died, then succeeded Edgar, his brother, and reigned 16 years and eight weeks and two nights. When he died, then succeeded Edward, son of Edgar, and reigned. So that's quite a lengthy there, but you can see the incredible attention to detail of the lineage of the dynasty there, not only going back, but they're actually going forward as well, because if you listen to some of the names there, uh, they're even going right up to the Alfred the Great and um, his son Edward the Elder and eventually um, King Athelstan. Um, so I think it's very important to bear in mind, obviously, that this obviously bears prudence to the fact that Alfred the Great was the one who commissioned this because uh, why would they put so much emphasis on mentioning him, the lineage, so early? Indeed. Indeed. And it, it also has this... It's, it's a view, by tracing lineage back to progenitor kings who are rooted in the divine, who are these sort of otherworldly mythological status heroes and kings it, it's this it is it is a view of history that's very alien to modern man who views himself as ascending and improving generationally when you see in this in this model it's it's you have that which is high which precedes everything else and it, it's sort of an Evolian sense of history, or you could say it's it's similar to when Tolkien has the Valar, and you see that you see that the line of Gondor is descended from a type of man who was higher than the status of of man in the later ages. Uh, yes, ab absolutely. Um, obviously, being descended, descended from the four-blooded kings, of, kings of Numenor, and obviously, as time goes on, and they they marry the the blood dwindles, dwindles, and it is weaker. 
But no, thank you. That was a, a really nice analogy. Uh, so uh, was there anything else you wanted to bring up during this period or shall we move on to the uh, the next slide? Yeah, we can certainly continue on. Okay, so here we deal with the Viking invasion. So um, on the left-hand side here, this is the ruin of Lind Lindisfarne Priory, which was um, on a small island in the north, off the north uh, eastern coast of, of Britain um, in, in, in Northumbria. It was the very first Viking raid onto um, British soil. And um, I actually want to read the entry for this. Uh, just bringing it up for one moment. Oh, it just says one last aside on the Roman Britain matter. Uh, there, if if you're a gamer out there, for all you gamer lads out there, uh, if you want to play a game that has a segment with Roman Britain, albeit you know historical fiction and very much, uh, you know, it's not exactly. Don't treat it as history. But if you want a, a little bit of some fun Roman Britain action. Uh, you should definitely check out the game Rise, Son of Rome, which came out like 10 years ago. It was like a launch title for the old, for the last generation of Xboxes. But it's it's got some pretty fun segments where you're, you're a Roman legionary and you're going through the deep, dark woods of Britain and you're encountering you're encountering this like giant wicker man and you're like fighting these Britons who are who are just like totally wild and it's 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 fun I'll, I'll say that it's it's not a again it's not history exactly but it's it's certainly an entertaining artistic portrayal of something that you don't really see covered in media um i've not actually played that game but um i have a friend who did play it and i did watch it they did stream it so i did watch a little bit of it so i know i know what you mean but um <laughs> uh, yeah so here we go so, AD 793, this year came dreadful forewarnings over the land of the Northumbrians, terrifying the people most woefully. These were immense sheets of light rushing through the air, and whirlwinds and fiery dragons flying across the firmament. These tremendous tokens were soon followed by a great famine, and not long after, on the sixth day before the Ides of January in the same year, the harrowing inroads of heathen men made lamentable havoc in the Church of God in Holy Island, by rapine and slaughter. Sigurd died on the eighth day before the calends of March. So there, this at the very beginning of this section on the Viking invasions, you've got this very vivid um, portrayal of apocalypse and, and tomb, especially with the mention of, of dragons there as well. Yeah, it, it also taps into the the great thing about reading direct sources and not just secondary sources is that and and especially just as you go through year by year and you see the notes that are put down you really get a glimpse into the pre-modern mind of the men of this place and time who had a idea of the world around them or a conception of the world around them that was it it had enormous room for what we would call fantasy or, or th the fantastical you know sci like uh, you see constantly throughout the anglo-saxon chronicles you see mentions of cosmological events and signs in the heavens an asteroid flies past and this is an omen for greater things to come or mention of as you see dragons you know things that to the people of the time they certainly didn't necessarily perceive them as as mythological creatures they're like oh no you know this is just this is just part of the world we live in it's they lived in a much more a much more wild and fantastical frame of mind and um, yes they, uh, they they didn't need a source for everything they just they had profound <laughs> beliefs which they went along with um, um, Monk, do you have a source for the for the dragons you saw flying overhead? <laughs> Indeed. But, and I'm not making fun of uh, modern midwits, but... Um, <laughs> <laughs> yeah, yeah they few... don't appreciate, yeah. I mean, science guys today, they don't appreciate the importance of, of dragons in the heavens. No, indeed not. But, um, yes, um, so obviously during this period, um, other than Lindisfarne, there were many um, Viking raids into Britain, um, so killing many, um, 
destroy a lot of churches, um, acquiring much bo booty and, and wealth. Uh, but the culmination of this, as I mentioned before, is um, obviously at this time you've got the great um, Viking um, leader Ragnar Lothbrok, um, who is um, on a raid into Northumberland. Um, he's defeated in battle by King Ayla. Um, King Ayla punishes him by having him thrown into a pit of, um, I believe it's um, adders or, or vipers, and he's yeah. beaten to death. Um, and um, and very forebodingly, um, his final words are, "Oh hell, the the little pigs will weep to will oink to hear that how the old boar suffered." <laughs> it's such it's such a beautiful it's such an amazing uh, line and and so it's present and. You know whether or not that's what he actually said. It's just presented with this, this sense of uh, incredible defiance and a sense of almost self-satisfied mirth that you know King Ayla and the Northumbrians are going to get what's coming to them for for killing uh, for killing him in such a manner. It's it's just a it's a his death poem is. Yeah, it's an iconic piece of literature. Um, yes, indeed, because um, obviously, as you know, with the Vikings, they believed you would only go to Valhalla had you died in battle. And so considering he was sort of tortured in a quite humiliating way, it's, it's understandable that his sons were not too best pleased. <laughs> so um, years later, in about um, the 860s, um, you have the landing of the Great Heathen Army. So this is unlike and lo and anything. lo behold, that... who's leading the army? But Ragnar's sons, yeah, in, indeed. Um, well, they st and the thing is, they, in terms of a revenge, it is a wild revenge because not only do they invade Northumbria, defeat King Ayla, and then a uh, blood eagle him. Um, for those who don't know, a blood eagle is an incredibly brutal Viking execution. <laughs> <laughs> where, um, yeah, hopefully you're not yeah. eating eating uh, supper right now when you're when uh, Hitman describes this. <laughs> Uh, yeah, so you are, you're nailed to a, to a tree um, forwards, and um, with um, implements they break your um, your rib cage from behind, and then they rip out your entrails into the shape of a bloody pair of wings. So it is incredibly they pull brutal. Pull out your lungs and spread them. Yeah, they like only the reserved like it wings. for people that greatly offended them. There is some argument, you know. I've I've been in uh there's been some arguments like in group chats i've been in over my my scandy group chats over was the blood eagle real were we were we really that savage back in the day and you know there's a case to be made perhaps that it's exaggerated however however there is a rune stone in sweden which does appear to be depicting a blood eagle v very similarly to how it's described so uh, I'm I'm of I'm of team Blood Eagle is very real. Um yes, and you know I'm I'm sorry, but I I believe that humanity can be incredibly cruel and brutal when they want to be. So I, I don't think it's an, I don't think it's not impossible certainly, and it makes a much more interesting tale that that it's there than than rather it not be there. So, uh, but <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. So anywho, so King Ayla has been a memorable been, way to go out. Yes, certainly. <laughs> Uh, yeah, so anywho, so after the death of King Ayla, the Great Heathen Army don't stop there. They, as you can see on this map on the right, they advance south and they proceed to completely pillage and burn um, Anglo-Saxon England. Um, so they actually end up conquering um, most of Northumbria, uh, the eastern side of Mercia and all of East Anglia. Um, also, it's important to mention here that when I mentioned the Heptarchy before, uh, by this point, um, when I was reading that section about all the lineage of the kings of Wessex, there was a King Egbert, or Egbert that was mentioned. Um, he was um, Alfred the Great's grandfather, and he was a very important, powerful king of Wessex because he was the one responsible for consolidating and conquering a lot of these smaller kingdoms. And so by the time you have the Great Heathen Army, there was actually only four Anglo-Saxon kingdoms. The three main ones being Northumbria, Mercia, and Wessex, and then you've got the smaller one of East Anglia. Uh, so, um, so the Great Heathen Army also actually conquer Essex from 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 Wessex, uh, but they do manage to hold on to most of their territory. And um, 
There's just a few segments here I want to read about the passage of the, uh, the Great Heathen Army. AD 867, this year the army went from East Angles over the mouth of the Humber to the Northumbrians as far as York, and there was much dissension in that nation among themselves. They had deposed their king, Osbert, and had admitted Ayla, who had no natural claim. Late in the year, however, they returned to their allegiance, and they were now fighting against the common enemy, having collected a vast force with which they fought the army at York, and breaking open the town, some of them entered in. Then was there an immense slaughter of Nor the Northumbrians, some within and some without, and both the kings were slain on the spot. The survivors made peace with the army. The same year died Bishop Ilstan, who had the bishopric of Sherborne fifty winters, and his body lies in the town. AD 868, this year the same army went into Mercia to Nottingham, and there fixed their winter quarters, and Bered, king of the Mercians, with his council, besought Ethered, king of the West Saxons, and Alfred, his brother, that they would assist them in fighting against the army. They went with the West Saxon army into Mercia, as far as Nottingham, and there meeting the army on the works, they beset them, with, them within. But there was no heavy fight, for the Mercians made peace with the army. AD 869, this year the army went back to York and sat there a year. AD 870, this year the army rode over Mercia into East Anglia, and there fixed their winter quarters at Thetford. And in the winter, King Edmund fought with them, but the Danes gained the victory and slew the king, whereupon they overran all that land and destroyed all the monasteries to which they came. The names of the leaders who slew the king were Hingwa and Hubba. At the same time came they to Medhemstead, burning and breaking and slaying abbot and monks, and all that they there found. They made such havoc there that the monastery, which was before full rich, was now reduced to nothing. The same year died Archbishop Kaelnoth and Ethred, Bishop of Wiltshire, was chosen Archbishop of Canterbury. Yes, that's the end of the bit of the Viking invasions. Uh, uh, was there anything you wanted to bring up before we move on to the, the next bit? Uh, just, just a small comment that in the Chronicles, when the word Dane is used, Dane generally does mean someone from Denmark. The majority of the great heathen army was Danish from what we know, although there were still uh, quite a number of Norwegians and some Swedes who were part of these invasions, but they were just lumped in as Danes. So if someone is referred to as a Dane, it doesn't necessarily mean they were from Denmark, but essentially all the Vikings were referred to as Danes. But by the time you get to the, the Great Heathen Army, it's less of pirat small piratical bands and more of a, a, an actually properly formal army going about raiding and pillaging and, and making war, it's a bit more conventional by that stage. Uh, certainly, and um, again, with this idea of um, the term Dane referring to um, all um, Scandinavians, um, it's also like how the Anglo-Saxons or English people were just called Saxons, regardless of whether they were Saxons, exactly. Angles, or Jutes, so it's just a collective term that was used. Indeed, yeah. Yeah, that's a great, that's a great comparison there. Mm. Mm -hmm. Okay. Uh, and so... I have noticed we do have the same translation, so that makes it easy to follow. Oh, well, that's always helpful. And um, with the those names, Hingwar and Hubba, uh, I assume Hubba is referring to Uber Ragnar's son. Would you agree? Or I would assume so. It's it's close enough that, and considering the time and place, it's it's pretty much got to be Uber, but. That is a challenge when you get to a lot of literature from this era, from around the North Sea, is there isn't this standardization of spelling that has been passed down. So oftentimes you do get variances in how names are described. So it can be it can be a challenge to track. Okay, who are they? Who's being referred to here? Um, yeah, the the versions of each name can get quite confusing. You even see that with popular figures such as uh, Ragnar Lothbrook, who is who is spelled in several different variances depending on how you want to take the Old Norse. And it's the same with the Saxons too, because obviously at this time, the Anglo-Saxon spoke Old English, which was far more Germanic than modern English. And you right. see that in, in the name. So obviously 
we say Alfred, but they would have said uh, Alfred. Alfred, yeah. Uh, and Alfred means what? Elf? Elf Council? Uh, uh, I, I think it was Elf Friend, actually. Elf Friend? Elf, yeah, it's, it's, yeah, what, it's, it's Elf something. Yeah. 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 Yeah, so I we really need to bring back i mean alfred has fortunately stayed around but we need to really bring back some of these old these old anglo-saxon names there's just this uh this great primal power to them they're they're beautiful no no i agree i mean edwards is the only one i think that's really in use um the older name version being being edward uh, but no since the uh the norman conquest um a lot, a lot of names people think are english are actually french so you know um you, you know Tom, Dick, and Harry. Well, two of those names are French, not English. If you uh, if you go back, really? so wait, which ones? Which ones are French? Uh, Robert and Henry are French oh, in origin. Right, yeah. Okay, mm. that's I didn't I didn't realize that. And, and Thomas and, and Thomas is Hebrew. So. Yeah, yeah, you do get you do get a lot of Hebrew names like like John sounds totally. That's about as uh, classically European sounding as you can get, or like a white person name. That you would think of, but it's yeah, of course it's Hebrew, but it's uh, become uh, so much ingrained that it's just kind of normal. No, 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 it's obviously the the biblical heritage. So, okay, so right, indeed, indeed, yeah. And here we come to the reign of King Alfred. So, uh, so here we've got two maps. So, uh, so what what happens essentially is the Great Even Army carries on. Uh, there's several more battles. Um, Critically, there's one known as the Battle of Ashdown, which is um, where um, you've got King Ethered and his brother Alfred, who would then become Alfred the Great, uh, win a great victory, but they're, then they're defeated. Uh, Ethered dies and Alfred becomes the king. And um, there's obviously a moment where the the, uh, the Vikings completely overrun uh, Wessex and he's forced to um, go off into the, the swamps um, for a while before he returns and is able to drive them out. Um, so... Is is this the point in which, in Alfred's life, where he resides in the village, um, and it what he's like scolded? He's in disguise and he's scolded by what? Uh, yes, yes, yeah. yeah. <laughs> <laughs> I yes. Mean, it shows his humility of being willing to to do that. Mm. Um, I think she scolds him because I think he burns her um, her, her buns or something. Yeah, yeah, yeah. He's like ba- <laughs> trying to bake. He messes it up. Mm. Yeah, yes. Yeah, so oh, very... Alfred, you've done it this time. <laughs> Indeed, and um, yeah. So, so a piece is eventually signed, and what ends up happening is you, as on this map on the left, you see there is a petition. Um, of England, um, of the kingdoms between um, Alfred and the the Vikings. So Wessex, um, as I said, keeps most of its territory, but it does critically lose uh, Middlesex, where London is, as well as Essex. However, they are able to retain uh, the western half of Mercia, while the Danes get everything else. And in the north, you can see there's a a rump um, kingdom of Northumbria, um, which, as you can also see, for a time, Northumbria also included um, areas of no- Lowland Scotland. And um, it's also interesting in Scottish history that the Lowland Scots actually spoke a form of um, Old English um, rather than, than Gaelic. It was only later mm. when the Gaels conquered um, the southern parts of Scotland. And interestingly enough, they ended, the Gaels end up incorporating elements of... Um, because with, with the old Scottish language, there's Gaelic, but there's also um, what's called Scots or Scots English, which is um, close enough to English that you can understand it, but there's lots of, their, of, of its own dialect, if that makes sense. And a lot of that is derived from the Anglo-Saxon um, inhab- inhabitants of the lowland um, Scotland. Oh, another thing just for the those listening to be aware of is that there's some, I mean, the portrayal of the anglo-saxons and the jutes is really frustrating in contemporary media and uh, and i mean that's where people get most of their conception even if even if you're not seeking it out it's it's very frustrating too because constantly i mean they're just portrayed and this is you know a symptom of the times that we're living in they're constantly just portrayed as these sort of weak effeminate um overly overly civilized people being just taken over brutally by these much more hyper-masculine Vikings coming in. 
And it's it's quite frustrating because, you know, they really wouldn't have looked in terms of their their physical appearance, in terms of their gear. They really wouldn't have looked all that different from the invading Vikings. And there's this, yeah, really annoying, I think partly because it's this, it's it's seen as socially socially fine to beat up on the English or socially fine to beat up on Christians. There's this constant subtle subtle ways of framing the English as being, yeah, weak or the force that you should not root for. And it's it's frustrating to see. Um, yes, because I actually watched your, your video on Assassin's Creed Valhalla. Um, oh, yeah. Because, uh, <laughs> oh, man. Uh, yes, because um, you're not the only one, because I think um, American Krogan also did a video on that game as well. And um, the things they, they do in that game really made me quite angry. I'm never going to play that game because <laughs> it, it's... Yeah. It's, oh, it's I mean, it's, it, is a, it, it is, a, you know, a, a murder simulator of... Killing, killing Anglo-Saxons, and uh, yeah, like they're physically smaller in the game too, and and you see that it's not just limited to games. I mean, you see that like in the Vikings TV show, or or uh, yeah, a lot of the sort of popular Viking or medieval English media of the day, and also the armor is often it bugs me because they'll often make the armor totally wrong in such a way that makes it a lot less cool. So it's like, okay, it's one thing if you're changing, you're going and doing something that's not historically accurate because you want to make something a little more stylish or cooler. But they actually downgrade the armor and the helmets and the overall aesthetic look of the Anglo-Saxons and even of the Vikings too because they, they make them look a lot more primitive and a lot, a lot less stylish than they actually were. They actually looked incredibly cool. No, absolutely. And um, like, again, you talk about this presentation. Because um, one thing that does annoy me with this presentation is that all these Anglo-Saxon men are presented like they're modern-day Eng Englishmen, um, speaking very refined and um, in, in modern in modern English. And it's well, <laughs> the simple fact was is that, as I said, old English was very Germanic. It had almost no Latin influences in it. If anything, they would have sounded more more like like the Northmen. And in, in if it's to be believed. Uh, Anglo-Saxons and Northmen could understand each other because the languages were similar enough. So, and I will say to to stick up for my my uh, Scandinavian bros, my my ancestors, uh, to stick up for them. There is, yeah, I will say there is a little bit of woe is me sometimes from from the good English folks about well, you know, Vikings were really mean to us and they were savage and they were backwards heathens, but we were. We were more. We were the more civilized, noble people. But again, we do have to. We only have to look a few hundred years back to see that the Anglo-Saxons were basically just Vikings going back a few hundred years. Not to not to discount the the important distinctions, but in terms of you know they were the the violent heathens just two or three hundred years prior. So or not even in some cases they they were quite similar. So. It is to say that the primary, you could say the primary civilizational difference between the Anglo-Saxons and the Vikings is just that the Anglo-Saxons were Christianized a little bit earlier than the Scandinavians. Yeah, no, Wait, no, would, no, you, no. would you agree to that? Would you say oh, no? That? I, I, I would agree. I would, yeah, I would agree with that. Broadly speaking, the only real major difference is one was Christian and the and the other wasn't. So. And had had the situation, you know, had the Scandinavians become Christianized first, let's say the map was flipped and Rome was in the Arctic, then you would have probably seen a very similar situation happening in reverse. I don't want to get too speculative mm -hmm. historically because, of course, there, there are many reasons that history plays out the way it does and the particular character of the Anglo-Saxons does have some key differences to, to the Danes and to the Norwegians, etc. But, but is it is just to kind of harp on this point that, yeah, I mean these were all Northmen, these were all hardy, uh, aggressive, and dominant Northmen that were going about doing their thing, and 
they they really were not it was not like one one team of of wild wild northmen who were beating up on effeminate effete high oh, incredibly civilized Englishmen to their south it was really it was a contest of peers in many ways no, no absolutely and um Okay, and what I want to do is, uh, there's just a couple other passages I want to read um, from the reign of King Alfred that sort of carry on the um, the conflict um, between the Saxons and the Great Heathen Army, so I'm just going to bring that up. Okay, AD 871. This year came the army to Reading in Wessex, and in the course of three nights after rode two earls up, who were met by Alderman Ethelwolf for Englefield, where he fought with them and obtained the victory. There one of them was slain, whose name was Sidrach. About four nights after this, King Ethered and Alfred, his brother, led the main army to Reading, where they fought with the enemy, and there were much slaughter on either hand, Alderman Ethelwolf being among the skein, but the Danes kept possession of the field, and about four nights after this, King Ethered and Alfred, his brother, fought with all the army on Ashdown, and the Danes were overcome. They had two heathen kings, Bagsag and Health them and many earls, and they were in two divisions, in one of which were Bagsack and Healthden. The heathen kings and in the others were the earls. King Ethered therefore fought with the troops of the kings, and there were King Bagsack slain, and Alfred his brother fought with the troops of the earls, and there were slain Earl Sidrach the Elder, Earl Sidrach the Younger, Earl Osburn, Earl Fren, and Earl Harold. They put both the troops to flight. There were many thousands of the slain, and they continued fighting till night. Within a fortnight of this, King Ethelred and Alfred, his brother, fought with the army at Basing, and then the Danes had the victory. About two months after this, King Ethelred and Alfred, his brother, fought with the army at Marden. They were in two divisions, and they put them both to flight, enjoying victory for some time during the day. And there was much slaughter on either hand, but the Danes became masters of the field, and there was slain Bishop Heckmund, with many other good men. After this fight came a vast army in the summer to Reading, and after the Easter of this year died King Ethered. He reigned five years, and his body lies at Winburn Minster. Then Alfred, his brother, the son of Ethelwolf, took to the kingdom of Wessex, and within a month of this, King Alfred fought against all the army with a small force at Wilton. Along pursued them during the day, but the Danes got possession of the field. This year were nine general battles fought with the army in the kingdom south of the Thames, besides those skirmishes in which Alfred, the king's brother, and every single alderman and the thanes of the king oft rode against them, which were accounted nothing. This year also were slain nine earls and one king, and the same year the West Saxons made peace with the army. Uh, AD871, and the Danish men were overcome, and they had two heathen kings, Bagsack and Halfdeen, and many earls, and there was King Bagsack slain, and these earls, Sigrat the Elder, and also Sigrat the Younger, Osborne, Freen, and Harold, and the army was put to flight. So again, there you can see the two passages there, the second one there, with the shorter retained some of the information that was in the other one. And um, I think also with the spelling of the names, again, I think that's from another version of the Chronicles. Hmm, yeah, yeah. Yes, and so if we now just go to the map on the right, so essentially after lots of initial warring, um, there was a ceasefire, but later on uh, Alfred um, does go to war with the Danes again, and by, 18, by 886 um, he's able to conquer some more territory off of them. So uh, if you notice, the two main gains are he actually manages to retake London um, from the Danes, uh, which is re-emitted back into uh, Mercia, and he also is able to push in the northwest and um, actually take Manchester and parts of uh, Lancashire. And also, if you notice, the Kingdom of Strathclyde in Scotland pushes down as well, um, taking all of Cumbria. So the, the so the Danes and territory in the northwest is significantly uh, reduced. Uh, so, uh, and it's also important to note that due uh, during this time um, as well, uh, you can see that uh, with how it's labelled on the map, though uh, Alfred took the name in 886 King of the Anglo-Saxons, there was a degree of autonomy uh, required 
left with Mercia. Uh, is there anything else significant that you want to um, bring up regarding the reign of King Alfred at all? Or... I mean, Alfred, Alfred is particularly interesting because he, he does have this sort of... He does kind of embody this warrior, but also has this sort of scholarly quality to him in in a king. And he is this, I mean, he's this kind of pivotal figure in the formation of what we think of as England today. I mean, without Alfred, I, I can't imagine there really even being English history as such. No, absolutely. No, he's incredibly um, defining um for the the anglo-saxons as a, as a people and because essentially with his victory um all of um the anglo-saxons pledged fealty to him or the ones that are not under danish um law rule that is because uh, i think there's actually another passage i wanted to read uh, yes it's about retaking in london i'm just going to give that a quick read as well so uh okay Oh uh, yeah, so AD 886, this year went the army back again to the west, and that before were bent eastwards and proceeding upwards along the Seine, fixed their winter waters in the city of Paris. The same year also, King Alfred fortified the city of London, and the whole English nation turned to him, except that part of it which was held captive by the Danes. He then committed the city to the care of Alderman Ethered to hold it under him. Uh, so one of the reasons why I believe... Um, Alfred's able to retake some territory as the the Vikings also decide to go attacking France and raiding Paris around the same time. So Alfred sort of was taking advantage of the distraction. Uh, last time um, we left off uh, with the reign of Alfred the Great. So just to quickly recap, so um, in 886 AD, he takes advantage of the, well, the Danes are distracted raiding France and he retakes London and is proclaimed king of the Anglo-Saxons uh, in 886 AD. And then he rule, he has the rest of his reign in relative peace and he dies in 899 AD. And he's succeeded by his son, uh, Edward the Elder. So, so, okay, so with Edward the Elder, so uh, he rules for a relatively decent length of time, uh, just about 25 years. And there's actually a passage I want to read for his accession. I'm just going to pull that up. Okay, here we go. So, the reign of King Edward, AD 901. This year died Alfred, the son of Ethelwolf, six nights before the Mass of All Saints. He was king over all the English nation, except that part that was under the power of the Danes. He held the government one year and half less than 30 winters. And then Edward, his son, took to the government. Then Prince Ethelwold, the son of his paternal uncle, rode against the towns of Winburn and Twynham, without leave of the king and his council, then rode the king with his army, so that he encamped the same night at Badbury, near Winburn, and Ethelwold remained within the town with his men that were under him, and had all the gates shut upon him, saying that he would either there live or there die. But in the meantime, he stole away in the night and sought the army in Northumberland. The king gave orders to ride after him, but they were not able to overtake him. The Danes, however, received him as their king, they then rode off the wife that Ethelwald had taken without the king's leave and against the command of the bishops, for she was formally consecrated a nun. In this year also died Ethelred, who was alderman of Devonshire, four weeks before King Alfred. So as soon as um, Edward becomes king, uh, his cousin, um, Ethelwald, who was the son of Alfred the Great's predecessor, um, I think they were also called Ethelwald, uh, so, going off of sort of a kingly or royal um, succession, I think the argument there would be, well, I'm the son of the elder brother of the previous king, so I have a stronger claim. But there might seem to have been with uh, Edward, and he was able to, to persevere and maintain his throne. Right. Uh, any particular comment you want to make, um, Lord Hugo, or...? There, there is kind of this recurring pattern now we're seeing with kings having to steal away in the night, and you're you're getting a lot of a lot of the court intrigue 
goings on that's kind of covering from year to year. So it's it's fun to follow. Um, no, indeed, because it uh, it certainly intens- intensifies as we get through the uh, the tenth century. Yeah, so. I mean, you can you can definitely see it's got that. Uh, to take a pop culture analogy, it's definitely got that that Game of Thrones. You have your your you would have what six kingdoms at this time, and um, would it well, be... it's, well, it's funny you say that because um, this is um, well, this is some an analogy made by Apostolic Majesty, um, which is that he thinks George R. R. Martin just got the idea of seven kingdoms from the Heptarchy of England. So seven kingdoms being in Anglo-Saxon England and seven kingdoms in Westeros. So, yeah, and it, even if you look at the map of Westeros, it it, it is extremely reminiscent of England in its layout. So there, you could definitely see some borrowing of of concepts and political dynamics going on. No, certainly. But yeah, so anyway, so throughout Edward's reign. Uh, so, on the right, you, there's this image of the sort of, of the situation. So you've got obviously he's king of the Anglo Saxons, but also within then you've still got the two kingdoms of Wessex and of Mercia. Uh, so I can't remember if I mentioned this in the previous stream, but Mercia had a degree of autonomy within uh, the Anglo Saxon uh, kingdom, um, with uh, the position known as the Lady of Mercia. Um, and so during Edward's time, uh, he massively uh, clamps down on Mercia's autonomy. Uh, so relatively early in, in his reign, uh, these lands you see in, as you see, London, which was reconquered, was given to Mercia. Well, that is actually taken and annexed directly into Wessex, along with them, Hartford, Buckingham, uh, Gloucester there. Um, so those southern territories are directly annexed into Wessex itself. And then later, and then later on, he completely dispenses with the kingdom and just fully annexes Mercia. <laughs> so you, so you yes, yeah, yes, yeah, so you're seeing a grand sort of centralization um, of the kingdom. You're seeing power consolidate. Yes, absolutely. And um, in the rest of the Midlands, you can see there's um, so the Dane law um, isn't just one kingdom. You see, you've got the kingdom of York or Yorvik in the north. You've got the kingdom of East Anglia in the east and then you've got the five boroughs um which are these five town fortified towns which are derby repton uh, no sorry the derby nottingham leicester stanford and lincoln um yeah all of those i think bar one are county towns in england today so they're all are pretty significant and settlements and what it was notable for is that there's a grand conquest um, he's able to conquer um, the entirety of the king in, of East Anglia, but also uh, the five boroughs as well. So the Danes are only left with the uh, Kingdom of York. And there's another reading I just want to make from the Chronicle. Okay, so this next one's about Mercia losing its uh, autonomous status. Okay. Right. Yeah, so... Yes, in AD 919, this year also the daughter of Ethelred, Lord of the Mercians, was deprived of all dominion over the Mercians and carried into Wessex three weeks before midwinter. She would call called Elthwina. So Elthwina was the, the lady of, of Mer- Mercia. She was the daughter of the Ethelred, the previous Lord of Mercia, who had been descended from the from the kings that they'd had. And also, uh, there's another passage I want to read uh, which is a bit later. So this is after he's um, fully subjugated uh, all of his neighbours. Okay. Yeah, so AD 924, this year before Midsummer, went King Edward with an army to Nottingham and ordered the town to be repaired on the south side of the river, opposite the upper, and bridge over the Trent betwixt the two towns. Then he went to Bakewell in Peakland and ordered the fort to be built as near as possible to it and manned. And the King of Scotland, with all his people, chose him as father and lord, as did Reynold and the son of Edward Adolf, and all that dwell in Northumbria. Both English and Danish, both Northmen and others, also the King of the Strathclyde Wallians and all his people. AD 94, 
this year Edward was chosen for father and for lord by the king of the Scots and by the Scots and King Reginald and by all the Northumbrians and also the king of the Strathclyde Britons and by all the Strathclyde Britons. AD 924 this year King Edward died among the merchants at Farndon and very shortly about 16 days after this Elwood his son died at Oxford and their bodies lie at Winchester and Ethelstan was chosen king by the Mercians and consecrated at Kingston and he gave his sister to Offsay, son of the king of the old Saxons. So they, not only has he conquered um, all these Danish kingdoms in the east, but he's also um, forced the kingdom of York, but also the kingdom of Scotland and the Stra kingdom of Strathclyde to sort of swear fealty to him as their overlord. So again, we can sort of see this as a call back to the position of Brett Wilder or Britain ruler or wide ruler. So that yeah. was sort of the end. And and you're getting this as as we're shifting away from the end of the eighth century, past the ninth century, and now going into the tenth century, we're starting to see the lines blurred a bit more between the the Northmen as being this kind of outside threat, existential threat to everyone to being a bit more they're just another piece on the field, especially as they're more settled at this time. Yes, yeah, certainly. I, I think if I'm going to draw some sort of an analogy, uh, where they, you know, where the Great Heathen Army came in that first generation, there was a lot of vitality and vigor as they go around rampaging and conquering, and now as they're settled, they're the, farming and fishing. Yes. Um, yeah, swords into plowshares, as the saying goes. <laughs> so is there anything yeah. else you want to... Well, and continue? it's just interesting that they're willing to pledge fealty to English kings. Or at least some of them are at this time. Uh, mm, I think it's more just reflecting the reality of their situation. So... Um, they could not bend the knee, but then that would just give Edward an excuse to conquer and, and destroy mm. them. So they're probably just trying to survive. Mm, fair, fair, yeah. Mm. Okay, is there anything is else typically, you want to... That is typically how it goes, isn't it? <laughs> yes. <laughs> okay, is there anything else you wanted to go over before we move on to the the next bit? That, that was it for that section, yeah. We could keep going. Okay, so... For well, this next section, so this is one of the two uh, longer sections of the Anglo-Saxon Chronicle, um, this section on the title of the Kingdom of England. So we're dealing with the broad sweep of the 10th and the, the very first majority of the uh, 11th centuries. So uh, I have up here on the slide um, three prominent kings. So obviously you've got Ethelstan, um, who would be proclaimed King of the English in 925 AD. Uh, then you've got Ethelred the Unready, who's one the longest reigning king during this period. And then you've got, at the end there, Edward the Confessor, the last um, uh, major Anglo-Saxon king, um, with the exception of Harold Godwardson before the Norman Conquest. So, uh, so early into um, Ethelstan's reign, um, he actually manages to subjugate and fully conquer the northern mm. kingdom of York, um, actually uniting all of England. So I just need to pull up a reading for this. Uh, okay. Yep, so AD 95, this year died King Edward at Farndon in Mercia, and Elwood, his son, died very soon after this in Oxford. Their bodies lie at Winchester, and Ethelstan was chosen king in Mercia and consecrated at Kingston. He gave his sister to Offo, son of the king of the old Saxons, St Dunstan was now born, and Wolfhelm took to the archbishopric in Canterbury. This year, King Ethelstan and Sertric, king of the Northumbrians, came together at Tamworth, the sixth day before the calendar of February, and Ethelstan gave away his sister to him. Okay, uh, AD 97. This year, King Ethelstan expelled King Guthrif, and Archbishop Wolfhelm went to Rome. So there, he... He goes in uh, to the north, essentially. Uh, he submits King Guthrith to his authority and then just expels him a couple of years later, essentially. <laughs> Good way to remove a political rival quietly. 
No, no, absolutely. And um, so Athelstan doesn't rule for a very long time. He rules for about 13 years and um, before he dies. And he is then succeeded uh, by his younger brother, Edmund. And um, what happens when Edmund becomes king is, there's, as we've seen before, there's a challenge to his succession. Though rather than another um, Anglo-Saxon prince or Atheling, as they were called, um, contesting him, he's actually contested by a uh, a, a Norseman um, who's proclaimed king of Northumbria. So we sort of see this temporary partition again of England into these uh, kingdoms. So here is another passage. So uh, AD 941, this year King Athelstan died in Gloucester on the sixth day before the calendar of November, about 41 winters, dating one night from the time when King Alfred died and Edmund Atheling took to the kingdom. He was then 18 years old. King Athelstan reigned 14 years and 10 weeks. This year, the Northumbrians abandoned their allegiance and chose Anna for violence for their king. So they so have this. And and of Ireland is actually a, a Northman. He's not uh, Irish. <laughs> um, yes, because um, we need to remember at this time. I mean, the, the name do, the name certainly doesn't sound terribly Irish. Um, yes, it's just at this time. Um, remember, the Norsemen had also conquered and settled in Ireland as well. Remember, yes, the founding of, of Dublin or, or Dub later Dublin. Uh, so, so yes, he's a nor nor Northman, but from from Ireland. Indeed, uh, indeed, yeah. Yeah, so, um, so uh, any, any, so the Edmund has to deal with this um, uprising, but he's able to um, kick out um, Anlath after a couple of years. So uh, there's another passage. Uh, okay. There was actually quite a few, actually, because uh, going on after this, there's still many more rebellions from Northumbria, which is a recurring theme. <laughs> so... Yeah, AD 944, this year King Edmund reduced all the land of the Northumbrians to his dominion and expelled two kings, Anlaf the son of Sertric and Reynold the son of Guthurth. And then AD 948, this year King Edward overran all Northumberland because they had taken Eric for their king. And in the pursuit of plunder was that large minster at Ripon set on fire, which sent Vilferth built. As the king returned homeward, he overtook the enemy at York, but his main army was behind at Chesterford. There was great slaughter made, and the king was so wroth that he would fain return with his force and lay waste the land withal. But when the council of Northumbrians understood that, they then abandoned Eric and compromised the deed with King Edward. So by this point, um, th this is another recurring theme. You have a series of Anglo-Saxon kings that don't rule for very long because they all die prematurely. And you also notice there's a lot of um, fraternal succession. So rather than it going um, of sort of father to son, it goes from brother to brother because when the king dies, any children, if they have any, are too young. So rather we're in later periods, they'll just establish a regency. They just go, well, we're just the, um, the, the a Witan instead appoints a brother to be king instead. And so the succession moves horizontally rather than vertically. Mm. Mm. Yeah, so after Edmund, you've got um, Edred, who's brother. Uh, okay, and then there's another that's, rebellion. That's 955, right? Get Edred. Uh, yeah, reign nine and a half years. Mm -hmm. Yeah, okay. and then, yeah. Yeah, then, then AD 954. This year, the Northumbrians expelled Eric, and King Edward took to the government of the Northumbrians. This year, also, Archbishop Wolfstan received the bishopric again at Dorchester. Yeah, so it took many years, but um, Edward finally drives out the um, uh, Eric, which is um, Eric Bloodaxe, by the way, a very notable mm, um, yeah. like, um, Norse warrior. can't really forget the name. No, that uh, really sticks in the mind. Uh, yeah, there's lot, many great um, epithets um, during, during this period. It, because post-Norman conquest, it's all just, a, you know, your... William the first, William the second, and they, they kind of give up with epithets in, in England anyway. <laughs> right. okay. uh, so then called Edward dies and then King Edgar comes to the throne. So Edgar was the son of of Ethelstan. So, yeah, so he comes to the throne and he has actually has a relatively 
a stable reign. Um, he's actually able to consolidate and not have um, rebellions from the Vikings. Uh, but what happens is he dies in 979 and he's succeeded by, uh, he's got two sons, um, Edward and Ethelred. And um, there's an incredibly controversial um, event um, where Edward, because Edward had the support of the clergy and the church, whereas his younger brother Ethelred had the support of the nobility. And um, what happens, there's a sort of a dispute where uh, Edward is invited to a meeting by Ethelred's mother at the place called Corfe, and he's uh, brutally murdered. And then he would, and he's known to history as Edward the Martyr. So there's another passage I want to read. Okay. Right. Yes, yeah, so AD 979. In this year was Ethelred consecrated king on the Sunday fortnight after, after Easter at Kingston. And there were at his consecration two archbishops and ten diocesan bishops. The same year was seen a bloody welkin oft times in the likeness of fire, and that was most apparent at midnight, and so misty beams were shown, but when it began to dawn then it gilded away. AD nine seven nine. This year was and, King Edward. What is a welkin? Uh, well it's a bloody welkin, so I imagine it's some sort of, of struggle or rebellion. Mm. I'm, I'm not I've not heard the word before, but considering the word bloody in front of it, I'm assuming it's some kind yeah. of struggle. Well, that would, that would explain what they mean by you can see the fire at midnight and by dawn sort of fades away. So I'm assuming they're talking about a, a city or, or area in flames, it sounds like. Mm. Let me, yeah, no, okay, no. Let, I, now I'm curious. I have to figure this out. Okay, well, well, maybe while I'm reading the next bit, maybe you, you could look into it. <laughs> uh, so uh, okay. it means the vault of heaven, the sky, or the upper air. Okay, ah, maybe it's like saying a blood, like a blood red sky, possibly. Then that, yeah, that's probably what they're referring to. Because if, if I remember, um, this is a little bit tangential, but I remember from um, the Lord, the Peter Jackson Lord of the Rings films, there's a moment when Legolas, um, points to a blood red sky then i think it's the night after the uh, urukai are massacred by the um, rohan cavalry and he says your red sky in the morning means that blood was shed the previous night so and obviously we know when um, tolkien was heavily inspired by sort of anglo-saxon history so um perhaps um that's what it what it, what it again is referring to there's some sort of violent omen perhaps yeah and, and omens are just everywhere in in the writings here, so the, I mean, they took them. They took them deadly serious. Mm. No, absolutely. And okay, here we are coming up to the uh, infamous event. So, eighty nine seven nine. This year was King Edward slain at eventide at Corfe Gate on the fifteenth for the calends of April, and then he was he buried at Wareham without any kind of kingly honors. And then the um, chronicle goes into a kind of um, a poem. There has not been mid angles a worse deed done than this was since they first Britain land sought. Men him murdered, but God him glorified. He was in life an earthly king. He is now after death a heavenly saint. Him would not his earthly kinsman avenge, but him hath his heavenly father greatly avenged. The earthly murderers would his memory on earth blot out, but the lofty avenger hath his memory in the heavens and on earth widespread. They who would not erewhile to his living body bow down, they now humbly on knees bend to his dead bones. Now we may understand that men's wisdom and their devices and their counsels are like naught against God's resolves. This year Ethelred succeeded to the kingdom, and he was very quickly after that with much joy of the English Witta and consecrated king at King Kingston. So, so in the chronicle. I mean, I'd like to say the Chronicle, I think, is relatively neutral. I think it tries to keep to the facts, but there's obviously some biases. So, for example, it's clearly biased towards the Eng to the case of the English against the uh, the Northmen. But um, w in this incident, it's very clearly, I think, sympathetic to um, to Edward the Martyr here. Cause it, to, to whoever was writing this, it was clearly a calamitous event. And just again, as I'd said before, um, Ethel, I'm sorry, Edward was had support amongst the clergy who most likely would have been the 
people composing the Anglo-Saxon Chronicle, considering they were the literate population, so it makes sense that the sentiment is carried forth from the Chronicle. Yeah, and touch it, you touched on the point of being biased against the Northmen, and that reminds me that, and I don't think, you know, I don't think anyone who studies Viking history denies that, uh, you know, they had a propensity to engage in in uh, slaughter from time to time, and that they, they would uh, get up to some hijinks, as we say. They would, uh, they would do a little trolling. But there, there is a more recent argument that's been floating around and gaining a bit of popularity in some circles, which is the speculation that the Viking raids, the earliest raids, such as the raid at Lindisfarne, were not entirely random that the that which may have encouraged the vikings to begin these raids given the time and place was due to stories being passed through the danes up into into denmark and norway about the the expansion of the Holy Roman Empire, or would have just been Charlemagne's Charlemagne's empire and his decisions wherein he would massacre Saxons and massacre any holdouts of resistance that didn't want to join his kingdom. So there's some speculation that word of this had traveled further north and had led to some instigation of, well, you know, this is this is now foreign expanding territory that's you know coming up towards us. Maybe we should launch some raids on this hostile hostile empire. And at the time, um, at the time, parts of Britain were still allied with Charlemagne. So, I mean, Char- Charlemagne died in let's see seven sixty eight to eight died in eight ninety eight fourteen is when he died. Or eight fourteen. That's right. That's right. 768 to 814. Um, so it, it does partly match with the timeline. This is just a loose theory, though. There's no written evidence for this. Um, well, it's very interesting you bring this point up because um, this is an argument that's actually made by um, Arnold Toynbee. Um, are you familiar with him at all? No, I'm not. I'm not. Okay. Um, well, um, Arnold Toynbee, a um, very uh, famous um, English 20th century historian, um, uh, his magnum opus is a book called the uh, the study of history which is um massive it's like 10 to 12 volumes long but there's a two volume abridgment which um i would highly recommend um but essentially it's like a broad um analysis of sort of civilization and, and culture and um there's a bit where he's looking at the sort of the genesis of sort of western civilization and um and um he has this idea that um, with culture and civilization, there's like four stages. You've got the you've got the genesis, um, the growths, the breakdowns, and the disintegrations. And he actually, when he, he looks at the Scandinavians, uh, the, the Viking Scandinavians, and he calls them an abortive civilization. By this, he means he, in his mind they're a civilization that failed <laughs> stage one of being a civilization because, <laughs> uh, uh, yeah. And so the reason he says this is because he that he said they were they were distinct enough to, to be their own civilization, but they was inadequate growth or development. And he and he says, well, the reason their potential was lost is because all of their vitalism and vigor was again, like you say, because of the Christians and militant encroachment on their territory. Because as you said, the Charlemagne initiating the uh, the massacre of Verdun. Um, and, mass- and killing all the pagan Saxons, uh, the Germanic pagans felt under attack. And and in his because Toyn- one of Toynbee's ideas is that throughout history, he argues there's um, this concept to which he calls the uh, Volka Wanderung, um, etymologically from German, which make, roughly translates to a uh, folk wandering or the wandering of the people, um, which is mm-hmm. where these great um, barbarian uh, pe- people launch these grand migrations or conquests um, and destroy em- which are empire shattering obviously the most famous example would be the barbarian invasions that destroyed the Roman Empire um, but 
he sees the Viking incursions into Western Europe as a kind of Volker Wanderung um, in response to this challenge from the from Christian sort of feudal kingdoms. And he says that had they kept up this up, they could have carried on and been their own civilization. And but he argues that what happened is the Christians kind of decided to go a bit more passive and instead focus on trying to convert them in, and rather than trying to fight them. And he then, oh, he then yeah, and he, and he argues this kind of subverted the um, the Northmen to who then gave up their religion and adopted Christianity and then they just become part of Western civilization. So yeah, it's a very interesting um, uh, argument. Yeah, that's that's certainly that's certainly interesting. Although I'm I'm of course on the on Team Christian, so I would I would see that as a victory, as a dub, right there. Uh, to, to not, you know, to get, well. Although that being said, I mean they do join in with the rest of Europe and they become a part of the church and become Christian. But even while they're Christian, you know, it, it isn't preventing them from continuing to continuing to invade and launch raids and generally be warlike. Uh, you no, know, certainly, but but uh, yeah. So initially, as, as we'll, we'll go on for the through the um, the reign of King Ethelred the Unready, they would carry on attacking and raiding um, into in England, and it's only really um, I think once you get into the Crusades that they start directing their energies elsewhere. So, <laughs> <laughs> of course, of course, yeah. Uh, right. Okay. So, yep. So. Uh, Edward the Martyr um, is murdered, Ethelred becomes king, and it should be noted that um, when he becomes king, he's only eight years old, so call me cynical, but um, I see this as an attempt by these nobles and his mother, who have control over this child king, um, to extend their influence, so it was massively in their interest for this adult king to be deposed or murdered in such a, a, a brutal way. Yeah. Mm. I, I hadn't, when I first read the Chronicles, I hadn't um, read or viewed anything in, read or viewed anything in uh, the Game of Thrones series, but since since that time in the last year, I'd, I'd w watched portions of it, and now I'm really starting to see all the ways that Martin uh, took heavy, heavy influence from segments of it, certainly as far as the world building is concerned. Mm. Yeah, there's there's many nods to um, well English history. I mean, the most prominent one which people have pointed out is the um the, the War of the Roses. Mm. Mm. Yeah, yeah. Okay. Uh, yep. So, going through King Ethelred's reign, uh, it's mostly him trying to um not get conquered by the Danes. Well, they or raided. So they keep turning up, and this is where the term the Dane Guild comes in, or the gold to pay off the, uh, the the raiding Danes so they they will show up and the king just has to pay them off and, and they leave and this obviously causes a lot of burden because the king has to raise a lot of taxes to keep paying off this uh, Dane geld but at times they try and resist and um, there's a very famous inc incident which is I think it's 996 AD you have the Battle of Malden um, which is a Anglo-Saxon defeat uh, which, if anybody's more interested in, uh, Nathan Hood actually has a video on his channel where um, he reads the poem The Battle of Malden. So I would encourage everybody to go and check that out if you're interested. But um, speaking of poems, I understand that there's a poem that you want to read, Nort Hugo. Yeah, so there's a beautiful poem by Rudyard Kipling called Danegeld, which captures very eloquently why paying a Dane guild is, is such a bad idea. And it's a fairly short poem, so I'll just read it off here. Quote, It is always a temptation to an armed and agile nation to call upon a neighbor and to say, We invaded you last night. We are quite prepared to fight, unless you pay us cash to go away. And that is called asking for Dane guild. And the people who ask it explain that you've only to pay him the Dane Guild, and then you'll get rid of the Dane. It's always a temptation for a rich and lazy nation to puff and look important and to say, 
that we know we should defeat you, we have not the time to meet you. We will therefore pay you cash to go away. And that is called paying the Danegeld. But we've proved it again and again, that if once you have paid him the Danegeld, you never get rid of the Dane. It is wrong to put temptation in the path of any nation, for fear they should succumb and go astray. So when you are requested to pay up or be molested, you will find it better policy to say. We never pay anyone, Danegeld, no matter how trifling the cost. For the end of that game is oppression and shame, and the nation that pays it is lost. So that is The Danegeld by Rudyard Kipling. Mm, well, I've never heard of that poem from him before, but no, that was, that's wonderful. And um, I think very apt. Uh, you should always um, stand and fight rather than just um, keep giving the, the Vikings their gibs. <laughs> yeah, yeah, exactly. And, you know, this was used somewhat in this sort of idea of paying the Danegeld in the lead up to the Second World War about, you know, people were saying, well, don't appease, don't appease Germany because you're paying the Danegeld. So it has had this kind of reoccurring effect in in politics and, and English life. But it's, um, it's and it does kind of echo too, it, it reminds me very much of in American history of, you know, we do not negotiate with terrorists. It's It's that same sort of attitude, although, you know, it can be applied properly or improperly. Mm, well, I mean, just tangentially, um, I can sort of see where they're talking about with appeasement, but I don't think it quite fits because, I mean, the difference between um, a moustache man and the Danes was is that, well, moustache man wasn't really a direct threat to us we're in the way the same the Danes were, so... Right, right, and I'm not applying, uh, or I'm not implying that they were necessarily using it in a way that held up, but simply that that concept certainly has has recurred. And yeah, you see that. I mean, it's sort of the idea of you know paying the paying the hostage, the holder of the hostages, and then he takes more hostages. No, it's no still a wonderful poet and man, very very apt wisdom. And um, okay, this is the next passage I want to read. It's about a very infamous incident from um, Ethelred's reign. Which um, okay, AD a thousand and two. This year, the king and his council agreed that tribute should be given to the fleet and peace made with them, with the provision that they should desist from their mischief. Then sent the king to the fleet, Alderman Leofsi who at the king's word and his council made peace with them on the condition that they received food and tribute, which they accepted, and the tribute was paid at £24,000. In the meantime, Alderman the officer slew Ethi, high steward of the king, and the king banished him from the land. Then in the same length came the Lady Elfgiv, Emma, Richard's daughter to this land, and in the same summer died Archbishop Edolf, and also in the same year the king gave an order to slay all the Danes that were in England, this was accordingly done on the mass day of St. Bryce, because it was told the king that they would pursue him of his life and afterwards all his council, and then have his kingdom without any resistance. So this passage refers to the St. Bryce's Day massacre, where uh, Ethelred did order that all Danes were to be massacred. Uh, so They get redacted in, in Minecraft. Yes, exactly. Um, yes, yeah, so obviously a completely brutal event, and... Um, in retaliation for this, you then have um, even more intense Viking raids from um, King um, Svein Forkbeard of Denmark, um, who would later come to depose um, King Athelred. Um, so just sort of talking about the um, St. Bryce's Day Massacre, um, I don't know what your views are, but in my views, I, if you look back through history, um, generally speaking, if you massacre enough of people, it doesn't go well, because um, you kind of piss off their, um, their co-ethnic, so to speak, and they tend to seek revenge. Um, the most famous example is, um, if you look at Roman history, um, later in the late Republic, um, they had a series of conflicts called the Mithridatic Wars with the Mithridates of Pontus. Um, there's a moment where um, Mithridates overruns um, Rome's eastern provinces in um, Anatolia, modern-day Turkey, and um, he decides to massacre tens of thousands of Romans and Italians. And, and now a lot of the 
locals were happy with this because they hated the Romans, but all he did by this was just make the Romans just hate him forever. Mm. And yeah. it led to his undoing um, as he, as, as a Mithridates Darcy's would eventually be uh, conquered and, and overthrown and deposed. So, And all the Danes, of course, you know, just because they're in England doesn't mean that they don't have cousins and uncles and sisters and brothers who are just across the sea and are very closely related and very uh, pissed off. No, no understandably, because, um, you know, people took um, family, uh, kin and blood, and blood seriously. So it's, um, it's a, a very transgressive affront. So if you maybe we could say if, if you're going to commit such an act, maybe um, try and be prepared to deal with its consequences. Um, then, but and as and as we have seen, um, Ethelred wasn't quite ready. It's, it's <laughs> reminiscent of in the Old Testament when the Israelites are going into the Holy Land, and God says he he war he warns them. Well, he gives them an order and a warning, and he says, "All right, here is the tribe that you need to wipe out." But when you wipe them out, you have to wipe them all out. Because if you only wipe most of them out, they're going to be a thorn in your side. So if you're going to take this strategy, which, uh, you know, this very extreme total war, bellum romanum, down to every last man, woman, and child, it's like, well, if they're going to, if they're not going to complete the task, shall we say, then they're going to have, yeah, they're going to have total wrath coming their way. Mm. Well, I mean, that sentiment's also echoed in, in Machiavelli, because he, he does literally say, um, if you're going to destroy someone, go all the way, because if you wound them, they'll just want revenge. Right, like if you swing at the king, don't miss. Because you're not going to get a second <laughs> shot. Precisely. <laughs> yeah, so... But, it, but in uh, this way, there's really no way to... There, I mean, it, there's no way to do this and succeed. Because unless you march into all of Denmark and Norway and parts of Sweden and try to like massacre every every Scandinavian, I don't think I don't think that would uh, that was quite within their their set of options. Mm. Uh, no, and, and if anything, like the massacre of Erdogan before done by Charlemagne, I think all you're doing is um, is filling them with with, with a vigor and a resolve. Um, I'm, yeah. I'm actually going back to American history. There were those um, infamous words by um, Admiral Yamamoto after Pearl Harbor, where he says, um, "I feel all we have done by our actions ah. is um, is um, awaken a sleeping giant and fill him with a terrible result." <laughs> yeah, it, it is this. Yeah, that it's certainly something that happens repeatedly in history. I do wonder with the massacre of Verdun, with situations like this. If, and especially in that particular massacre, because you're you're massacring six thousand Anglo or six thousand Saxon men, and is it just men that are killed in that massacre? Um, you know, I believe it is just men, but I mean, I wouldn't be surprised if women and children were involved. But I, I've heard yeah. it just be men. So, I, as far as I'm, yeah, as far as I'm aware, just men. But I do wonder in a case like that. I mean, it's not. Certainly in history, when you do have these tribes that get massacred, it is typically the men. Sometimes the children get incorporated and the women get married into or turned into concubines. But in the case of something like Verdun, it's like, I do wonder what the long-term ramifications are on a genetic level, too, with a population. Like, if you take, because in that, you are taking the most stubborn men who are willing to potentially die for what they believe, even if what they believe is wrong. And you're like, all right, we're going to, we're going to kill that entire segment of the population based on the men who have these kind of old, very uh, set in their ways temperaments. What is that going to actually affect in, in your population going forward? It's, it seems like you're, you're doing this sort of, uh, potentially dysgenic effect to the population whereby the people who are remaining are going to be the most pliable. Now, maybe people convert for good reasons and they convert because they genuinely believe, 
oh, wow, yeah, Christianity is the way to go. And the Charlemagne guy is actually the good guy. It's pretty cool. And I'm going to convert for, you know, virtuous reasons. But you also may get this effect whereby you're just getting the most, you're getting people who are more weak-willed and the people who tend to be more, you could even say, conservative in their disposition. All of these men are no longer going to be around. They're not going to be passing on their their families and, you know, they're not going to be having sons that are also of that disposition. What do you make I of mean, that? Mm -hmm. it, it's true um, that it could have a dysgenic effect on the people, but remember, um, when it comes to a survival of the people, um, as long as the women survive, they can keep breeding and generate, and you know, new new people, right? Benefit. Whereas, if, yeah. yeah, whereas, it, you know, if you could, all, all the women are dead, you're kind of buggered, so... Um, <laughs> Uh, but, uh, it was also important because um, obviously I mentioned in the last episode where I briefly talked about um, Bede's ecclesiastical history, um, about the the sort of deluge of 7th century England where you've got the, the Anglo-Saxon people who are Christian, but those who are also pagan sort of fighting amongst themselves. I mean, you could say the same of uh, what Charlemagne did. Remember, the Franks were a Germanic people and they're right. attacking the Saxons, another Germanic people. The only difference is one's Christian and one's pagan. That's a, you could if you think of it that way. So the Germanic so people probably, yeah, probably evens out mostly by after a certain amount of time. Mm. Would you, would you think? Um, yeah. Uh, you know, I mean, there's definite short term, uh, problems there, but it's not, not anything that can't be fixed in the long term unless I don't know your people get absolutely wiped out. So, right. And just for uh, YouTube's sake, we're not endorsing uh, we're not endorsing uh, massacring Saxons. We love our Saxons. <laughs> we, we 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 love we love all them strong Germanic European peoples. Yep, yep. Right. Okay. And <laughs> so, so we're sort of coming to the end of um, Ethelred's um, reign, and I think it's um, we, sh we should probably um, discuss his name because it's. Um, it's been discussed before, but it needs to be because it's quite ironic. So for those who were curious, so uh, the etymology is Ethel Red. Uh, Ethel means um, well, and um, Red means to counsel or to advise. So his name means someone who is well counseled, and his epithet, the unready, means someone who's badly counseled. So his name literally means the wise counseled, the poorly counseled. <laughs> <laughs> That's amazing. I did not, I did not know that. Yeah, so quite an ironic name, um, considering um, his actions and where he leads and how his actions lead, lead England. So, yeah, so there's a, many invasions over a 10-year period from 1002 to about 1012, 10, 1014. 10, um, so King Svein I of Denmark comes in. Uh, so he deposes Ethelred and Ethelred's driven in exile into Normandy. And um, he, King Svein rules quite briefly though he dies a few months into his reign and then Ethelred um, comes back. Um, though there's more fighting, uh, Ethelred dies, and then there's, there's a further contest between Ethelred's son, uh, Edmund Ironside, and um, Svein's son, uh, Canute. Uh, of, there's a, a sort of another partition, again, as I mentioned before, uh, where the, we've, we've sort of got these partitions between North and South, um, they, Edmund Ironside and Canute agree to partition England with Canute getting Northumbria, Mercia and East Anglia with um, Irons, Iron, Edmund Ironside being granted Wessex. Uh, so they partition, but then Edmund Ironside tragically dies a couple of months later and then Canute takes all of England and then all of um, Edmund's um, family go into exile. Um, the most prominent one being his son, um, Edward the Exile. And there's another passage I want to read. So I'm just going to pull that up. Okay, so. Okay. So. Okay, so AD 1017. This year, King Canute took the whole government of England and divided it into four parts. Wessex for himself, East Anglia for Thurkill, Mercia for Edric, Northumbria for Edric. This should also win Alderman Edric slain at London, and Norman, son of Alderman Leithwin, Ethelward, son of Ethelmar the Great, and Beatrix, son of Elfeg of Devonshire. 
King Canute also banished Edwy Etheling, whom he afterwards ordered to be slain in Edwy, King of the Churls, and before the calendar of August, the king gave an order to fetch him the widow of the other king, Ethelred, the daughter of Richard, to wife. So here, what Canute does is that he partitions um, England again, this time into, into the four areas, so Wessex, Mercia, East Anglia and Northumbria, and he appoints an earl to each of the areas that he's not ruling. So he rules Wessex personally, and then he appoints like an earl to rule the upper three areas. Um, so there's sort of a um, a delegation of his rule. Um, it's also important to remember as well that he also inherits the title King of Denmark from his father, who's so King of England and King of Denmark. And later on, uh, as we'll get to, he he very briefly also becomes King of Norway and establishes uh, what's known to history as the uh, the North Sea Empire, um, a, a, this grand sort of feudal state that encompasses the North Sea. And what's in also other words, in... what's all, what we also refer to as the good old days. <laughs> um, well, the North Sea Empire was very short-lived <laughs> because um, it only lasted seven years. Hence, hence, so... hence days. <laughs> uh, I suppose that's one, one way of looking at it. Um, but what's also interesting is that... Um, so he marries um, King Ethelred's widow, um, Emma of Normandy. Um, and um, it's interesting he does this because um, I think she was popular amongst the, um, the, the nobility. So to legitimise himself and to probably draw some kind of connection to the previous um, dynasty, he, he marries her. And um, though this does cause complications because he has two sons, one son from his first wife and... Um, one son from from Emma, um, which leads to a um, contested succession. Okay, and uh, there is another short passage. So, ten twenty eight A.D. This year went King Canute from England to Norway with fifty ships manned with English thanes and drove King Olaf from the land, which he entirely secured secured to himself. So, yep. So that's him uh, taking over Norway. Uh, okay. And then I now want to jump forward to uh, the contested succession. So, uh, okay. okay. So, AD 1036, this year died King Canute at Shaftesbury, and he is buried at Winchester in the Old Minster, and he was king over all England for very nigh 20 years. And soon after his decease, there was a meeting of all the Witan at Oxford and Leofric, the Earl, and almost all the thanes north of the Thames and the Liftsmen at London chose Harold for chief of all England, him and his brother Harder Canute, who was in Denmark. And Godwin, the Earl, and all the chief men of Wessex withstood it as long as they could. They were unable to effect anything in opposition to it. And then it was decreed that Elfgiv, Harder Canute's mother, should dwell at Winchester with the king her son's household and hold all Wessex in his power, and Godwin the Earl was their man. Some men said of Harold that he was son of King Canute and of Elfgiv, the daughter of Elfhelm the Elderman, but it seems quite incredible to many men, and he was nevertheless full king over all England. AD 1037. This year men chose Harold king over all and forsook Harder Canute, because he was too long in Denmark, and then drove out his mother Elgither, the relic of King Canute, without any pity, against the raging winter. She, who was the mother of Edward, as well as of King Harder Canute, sought then the peace of Baldwin by the South Sea. Then came she to Bruges, beyond sea, and Earl Baldwin well received her there, and he gave her a habitation at Bruges, and protected her, and entertained her there as long as she, as she had need. Uh, this is in the same year it dies Effie, the excellent Dean of Eversham. At AD 1037, this year was driven out Elfgiv, King Canute's relict. She was Harder Canute's mother, and she then sought the protection of Baldwin south of the sea, and he gave her a dwelling in Bruges, and protected and kept her the while that she was the while that she there was. Uh, yep, so again you've got the two um wives. You've got um El Elfgiv or Elfgifu, who was a Anglo Saxon noblewoman who was the mother of um, Harder Canute, and then you have um, Emma, who was the mother of Harold. So, uh, so Harold, um, they well, 
the Witan wanted Harder Canute, but because, as the Chronicle says, he was in Denmark and spent too long there, they they make uh, Harold the King of England, Harder Canute the King of Denmark, but uh, Harold dies a couple of years in, and then Harder Canute becomes king anyway. But then he too dies a couple of years into his reign, and um, then um, the king here on the right here, Edward the Confessor, who was a son of Ethelred the Unresi and Emma of Normandy, um, then becomes the becomes the king. Oh, what another thing to to note about AD ten thirty is the events of King Knut's conquering of Norway sets in motion uh, sets in motion a character arc and some events that will come back to come back around to England in 1066 because in 1030 when in 1030 there is the battle of Stickleston in which King Olaf uh, the second Haraldson he also knows Saint Olaf. He's killed in battle. There's a coalition of local figures and local rulers who are opposing King Canute's army. And King Olaf is slain, but at the same time, Harold Sigurdsson, the a young Harold Sigurdsson is fighting alongside King Olaf. And after the battle, he's sped away out through Sweden and onto this with him with uh, a longship crew they're sent away to flee the north and then they travel south down through into uh, what was down through the river networks to um, shoot my my brain, my brain is freezing up here. Uh, anyway, he, he goes off on a on a long adventure himself, and as he gets older, he ends up coming back around 1066, which we'll get to the events that transpire there. Well, thank you very much for bringing up those events because yes, they are important to the uh, the chronology, as we'll we'll soon see. Uh, so. Uh, yes, there's one final uh, passage I wanted to read regarding um, Harold and uh, half a Canute. So, okay. It's AD 1041. This year died King Harder Canute at Lambeth on the 6th before the Ides of June, and he was king over all England two years, wanting 10 days. And he is buried in the Old Minster at Winchester with King Canute, his father. And his mother, for his soul, gave to the new minster the head of St. Valentine the Martyr, and before he was buried, all people chose Edward for king at London. May he hold it while the God that shall grant it to him. And all that year was a very heavy time in many things and divers, as well as in respect to ill seasons as to the fruits of the earth. And so much cattle perished in the year as no man before remembered, as well through various diseases as though tempests. And in this same time died Elsinus, abbot of Peterborough, and then our Arnavius, the monk, was chosen abbot because he was a very good man and of great simplicity. Uh, so I find it interesting because um, you may have noticed um, I put civic emphasis on the line there, and it's because the um, in the chronicle they actually put a exclamation mark at the end of the line, and may he hold it while that God shall grant it to him. Um, again, I think showing the um, the chronicler's disposition to um, the restoration of the House of Wessex. Hmm. Interesting. Mm, yeah, so there's like a sigh of relief that the the, uh, the the true natural house of England has been been restored um, under um, Edward the Confessor. Uh, okay. Yep. So he's restored in 1042. Uh, and by the way, um, I probably should. I don't think I mentioned this in the previous stream that uh, if anybody's familiar with this period, they may be confused with some of the dates. That's because the Anglo-Saxon Chronicle. Uh, the dating in there is out by a year or two, so some events might seem slightly off with the dates I've given, because I've read them as they are in the Chronicle. So just in case... Yeah, I've, could... I've wondered on a couple things, because occasionally I, I've run to a couple events that seem slightly off in timing. Yeah. 
I mean, unfortunately, they were they weren't perfect time keepers time keepers back a thousand years ago. So, <laughs> uh, right, okay. And uh, so, from there, is there anything else you want to say before we get on to the uh, the Norman Conquest? Uh, just a reading recommendation, which is to read the the saga of King Harold Sigurdsson, otherwise known as Harold Hardrada, which is taking place at this time, so from roughly, begins in roughly 1030 and follows to 1066. And it's this this whole other parallel story that's happening around Kiev and Rus and Constantinople at this time that ends up culminating in a huge portion of the events of 1066. So if you want the, the sort of parallel story that leads into it, the other character arc, that is the piece of reading to go through. It's it's wild. I, I actually have a whole video on it. I think it was the first video I posted. Um, I have I did watch that actually when I first discovered your channel. When the, a really great video and a fascinating historical figure. I may have to read that one day. Um, is that part of like the uh, the Heims Kralinga, I'm presuming, or is it something else? Yeah, yeah. Oh, it, oh, it is. Oh, even more reason to read the Heims Kralinga now. So. <laughs> Okay, and on to our final slide. So, um, as I'm, I might mention this before in the previous stream, but um, the Anglo, the final section of the Anglo-Saxon Chronicle, um, actually covers the entire period of the, uh, the House of Normandy and the um, period of the House of um, Blois, um, which is the period of 1066 until 1154. Um, so is that how you say it? Um, Blois. Well, it's French, so. Yeah, yeah we just yeah. <laughs> <laughs> Oh, it's French pronunciation, not your strong suit. Uh, not not particularly. I would I always read that as like Bloy. But um, I'm sure. I, 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 I think Bloy is wrong. Yeah. Mm, well, yeah. Well, I, I've heard enough French to know that I'm pretty sure it blah blah sounds more French than Bloy. <laughs> oh no! I, you're. I'm sure you're 100 percent correct. i my interaction with the French is virtually non-existent. Mm. Uh, yes, yeah, so though obviously it's, it's the Anglo Saxon Chronicle, I wanted to more focus on the Anglo Saxon period, which really comes to an end with the Norman Conquest. So uh, we'll, we're going to go over the Norman Conquest and then I may briefly do a chronology of the rest of the period. So, yep, yeah, so in 1066, um, Edward the Confessor uh, dies and we have a con contested succession. So uh, the Witan, because he dies childless, the Witan uh, elects um, Harold Godmanson, uh, a Anglo-Saxon alderman, to the kingship. Um, William of Normandy, and also also known as uh, William the Bastard, um, contests this, uh, claiming through a friendship with um, Harold, with um, Edward the Confessor, that Edward had um, promised the throne to him, and also we have, um, as you mentioned, Harold Hadrard, the King of Norway. He also contested succession um, through the claims of, um, I believe it's Hardikinut, um the previous um, Nor Nor Danish um, king uh, of England. Uh, so both um, William and Harold uh, Hardrada invade England. Um, Harold lands in Yorkshire uh, and he's actually killed in an ambush at the Battle of Stamford Bridge. Uh, so then Harold Godwinson uh, marches south uh, meets William at the Battle of Hastings, uh, where he is defeated. And um, though, because uh, it's interesting, because the Battle of Hastings is obviously it's a very important event in a uh, English and now I say European history. But um, I don't. A lot of people I, don't, I think don't appreciate um, just how much a close run thing it was. Because um, I think it very easily could have gone either way if things had played out differently. Uh, is, is it, what's your view? I'm not intimately familiar with how the battle played out, so I'd be I'd be very interested in hearing what your theories are on how how you think it could have played out differently. Uh, well, so okay, so in the battle, um, so William landed with his army at Pevensey in in Sussex. So, well, the armies, uh, so the Anglo-Saxon army is largely composed of infantry. So it's got the um, the shield, this Anglo-Saxon shield wall. And the heavy infantry, the Huskars, with their axes, and that's broadly what it is. It's a very heavy infantry army. They camp themselves on a 
uh, a hill called Sandlack Hill. So they've got he's got this hardy uh, Anglo-Saxon heavy infantry encamped on the high ground, and then you've got William's army. So his army has not got the high ground. However, his ar- army is more um, tactically diverse. So he's got his heavy he's got his infantry, which isn't as good a quality as the Anglo-Saxons, but he's got um, archers. So he's got the skirmishing potential, and he's also got critically uh, armored Norman knights, which are um, are, are a very high quality. Um, so he's got um, skirmishing and mobility on his side, but his opponent Harold has the high ground. Uh, and um, so how the battle plays out is um, William tries to send his infantry line forward into Harold's infantry. Um, they brawl for a bit. They're not able to uh, push the Saxons back. So his uh, his troops withdraw and he has to uh, rally them to make sure that they don't retreat because there's a moment where they think um, he's been killed and he has to rip his helmet off and show himself to his men. So he's able to rally. But what happens critically is that um, as his men um, are falling back, the impetuous um, Anglo-Saxon uh, infantry start to pursue them thinking the battle already won and then they come off the high ground and at that point um obviously um William's archers have been opening fire on them and they start to um obviously kill lots of the soldiers filling out the ranks and then the cavalry now their opponent are on flat ground charge into them and so so the battle is now on much more um favorable terms for the Normans but still it lasts all day and it's fought for several hours and then the crucial moment comes where King Harold is, um, well, there's actually a moment where he's shot through the eye with an arrow and he, well, on, in the image on the left here, this is um, how William the Conqueror is depicted in the uh, the Bayeux Tapestry, a famous tapestry that's um, commissioned after the con- conquest showing the Battle of Hastings. At Hastings. But um, there is, um, in another section of the tapestry, there is one of a, well-armoured Anglo-Saxon figure pulling an arrow out of his eye, and it's believed that this is depicting King Harold um, doing so, showing him he was quite quite a tough um, t- quite a tough oh. man. But um, but no, eventually he is slain and he's fallen, and then the Anglo-Saxon army just melts away, and um, William wins the day. So, as you can see there, though um, William had uh, a probably a superior quality um, army. Uh, his enemy had a terrain advantage and obviously were defending their own home turf. So um, had had luck not quite been on his side, it's very possible he could have been defeated. So, hmm. Yeah, no, I could, I can see that now. The, my familiarity with the Battle of Hastings extends only to the Age of Empires re- recreation, hmm. which I don't think is uh, exactly one-to-one. Mm. Um, well, I've played a couple of uh, video game adaptations of the Battle of Hastings. One being in Medieval Two: Total War, and another oh, in the game. It's in, uh, it's in Medieval Two. Yeah, and um, oh, no it's also in. in a, there's another game I like called Feel the Glory Two: Medieval. It's in that as well, and in both occasions, it, it's bloody difficult. Um, Have you pulled it off and, for the side uh, of England? Um, well, I actually have done it as both sides, and I've won as both sides, but it's still hard, no matter who, who which side you're playing. So. Nice, that's awesome. All right, I'll have to, I'll have to boot up after this. I'll have to boot up Medieval Two: Total War and play that out. Mm. Yeah, you have a challenge on your hands, but um, yeah, there is actually a passage I wanted to read regarding the conquest, so I'm just going to bring that up. Okay. Well, rather the, the Battle of Hastings, I should say. So, okay, AD 1066. In this year was consecrated the Minster at Westminster on Childer Mass Day, and King Edward died on the eve of Twelfth Day, and he was buried on the Twelfth Day within the newly consecrated church at Westminster. And Harold the Earl succeeded to the Kingdom of England, even as the King had granted it to him, and men also had chosen him there too, and he was crowned as King on the Twelfth Day. And that same year that he became king, he went out with a fleet against William, Earl of Normandy, and the while came Tosti, the Earl, into Humber with 60 ships. Edward the Earl came with a land force and drove him out, and the boatmen forsook him, and he went to Scotland with 12 vessels, and Harold, the King of Norway, met him with the 300 ships, and Tosti submitted to him, and they both went into Humber until they came to York. 
and Morkar the Earl and Edwin the Earl fought against them and the King of the Norwegians had the victory. And it was made known to King Harold how it there was done and had happened. And he came there with a great army of Englishmen and met him at Stanford Bridge and slew him and the Earl Tosti and boldly overcame all the army. And the while William the Earl lands at Hastings on St. Michael's Day and Harold came from the north and fought against him before all his army had come up. And there he fell, and his two brothers, Gerth and Leofwine, and William subdued this land. And he came to Westminster, and Archbishop Aldred consecrated him king, and men paid him tribute, delivered him hostages, and afterwards brought their land. And then with Leofric, abbot of Peterborough, in that same expedition, there he sickened and came home, and was soon and, and was dead soon after, thereafter. And all hallows mass night, God be merciful to his soul. In his day was all bliss and all good in Peterborough. And he was dear to all people, so that the king gave to St. Peter and to him the abbacy at Burton and that of Coventry, which Leofric the Earl, who was his uncle before, had made, and that of Crowland and that of Forney. And he conferred so much of good upon the minster at Peterborough, in gold and in silver, and in vestments and in land, and never any other did before him, nor any other after him. After Goldenborough became a wretched borough, then chose the monks for Abbot Brand, the provost, by reason that he was a very good man and very wise, and sent him then to Edgar the Etheling, by reason that the people of the land supposed that he should become king, and the Etheling granted it him then gladly. When King William heard say that, then was he very wroth, and said that the abbot had despised him, then want good men between them, and reconciled them, by reason that the abbot was a good man, then gave he the king forty marks of gold for a reconciliation, and then thereafter the tea a little bit, little while, but three years. After that came every tribulation and every evil to the minster. God have mercy on it. So, there we have the summary of the of the Norman Conquest or the initial um, period, because um, William is crowned on Christmas Day in London, but by that point he's only um, subjugated the southern part of the country, and it takes a few years for him to really subjugate the rest of England and. Um, in 1069, you have the event known as the Harrying of the North, where um, there's a um, an Anglo-Saxon prince, um, Edgar Etheling, um, who was mentioned there in the Chronicle, who was the, he's actually the grandson of Edmund Ironside. Um, he mm. is contesting the crown because uh, he's a, cause the Wit a Witan uh, elects him the King of England. And so he's actually supported by um, Svein II of Denmark, who was... Um, a grandson of Svein the first um, of Denmark, so he's a nephew of um, Canute. So uh, Svein the second um, comes in, and he actually supports um, Edgar Atheling, um, but he's actually defeated and driven out. Um, but that doesn't stop him from trying again a few years later. So, so in this initial period, um, William's having to deal with um, sort of Anglo-Saxon pretenders and Danish invasion still. And um, the Harrying of the North is incredibly brutal because um, uh, it's largely concentrated in Yorkshire and Northern England. And, and um, well, let's just say because England's population was about a million at the time and it's predicted that the Norman Conquest killed about 10% of the population. And this was heavily skewed towards the North um, where in the Domesday book it says something to the effect of like 75% of the population of, York, of Yorkshire die, which is genocidal wow. levels of death so yeah was was there a siege on york was it starvation or disease or, or oh, well, outright, well, outright well, well, well william just used um sort of fire and sword and um, scorched earth tactics to, to defeat them just burning all the lands so they couldn't get any food wow that's hardcore yeah the normans were hardcore yeah they were not to be trifled with so yeah so yeah, so that's really the end of the period I, I, we wanted to cover in any any kind of depth. Uh, was there any other commentary you wanted to make? That uh, just the question of there's been you know there's been speculation of this. Do you think there was any sort of coordination between the Normans and the Norwegians in 1066? in order to attack England and invade at the same, at basically the same time? Um, I don't buy that, um, because, I mean, I mean, both leaders, you know, 
Duke William of Normandy and Harold Hadrada are, are both claiming the same title. So, I mean, unless you're going to argue that they're going to affect some kind of partition, I don't know, like William gets Wessex and I don't know, Hadrada gets like Northern England, maybe if that's your argument, like that's possible, but I, I doubt it personally. I just wonder if there was any awareness from either side. They're like, well, you know, if not necessarily that they were allied, but in the sense of, well, this may be an opportune time to attack if you have these forces fighting amongst each other. I don't know. Um, it's just there's, there's been questions about it throughout time. So I, I don't have the information to make any sort of call on it but i'm just curious mm, i mean true um obviously whenever a king dies as we've seen throughout this whole stream in the previous one when a king dies their um their, their legitimacy is always called into question in this period so it's um it's just going along with the, the trends of the period and um i think it made more sense like... for both mm, um, i mean yeah that seemed like the right opportunity and um but also what's important to remember that the Chronicle actually admits is um, uh, William actually had the sanction of the Pope himself to invade England. The Pope hmm. uh, granted him papal sanction to invade. And so it's interesting that, the, again, remember the Chronicle would have been composed largely by clergymen. So it's interesting that these clergymen are admitting the, the fact that, you know, the leader of the, of the Catholic, of the Christian Church, the Pope, sanctions William's invasion. So it, again... Despite the link, they still, you know, as Englishmen or English people, still were not happy about this um, yeah. foreign ruler coming in and conquering the conquering the country. Is is there speculate or is there? Do you know why the Pope sanctioned William to invade? Um, the only thing I, all I can say, just trying to recall back, is um, I I be, well, what's what I will say though is a uh, later on when you get into the uh, 12th century is there's this controversy called the investiture controversy which is where um uh, the does the pope have the right authority to um invest or make bishops or is it the respective kings of the various kingdoms and that causes a lot of conflict between the pope and the holy roman emperors and it comes up in the reign of um uh, william's son william rufus so uh from what I remember, um, I think William does allow the Pope to invest any bishops in Normandy. So that possibly could be a reason why the Pope sanctioned his invasion. And it also possibly could be the um, William may have made some sort of financial donation to the to the church, possibly. Um, I don't remember the exact reasons. So that's just some speculation on my part. That's interesting. And what what is the contemporary perception of, uh, of King William when people look back, when English are taught about him or when they look back today? What's what's kind of the general sentiment? Um, well, when I learned it in school, um, it's kind of done sort of, I, I guess, rather um, factually. Like it, it's sort of like, you know, you know this is a major event in our history, the Norman Conquest, because, you know, this new new dynasty comes in and, um, you know, England is very different because we have this imposition of um, continental style and feudalism into into England, which it's been argued hadn't quite existed before. Um, though I would say the depth that I of, of that is quite muted because when I've learned it, I was like 11 or 12, whereas... Um, because there's also um, massive um, cultural implications because you have the imposition of, you know, a court where French is now the dominant language and not uh, not um, Anglo-Saxon or, or Old English. And then that has, you know, major um, effects on our language over the years. Right, yeah, yeah. Oh, definitely. <laughs> is the, the language of the court changed entirely. It was, it was French for that time, was it not? Um, yeah, so from 1066 until um, at least the reign of Edward III in the middle of the 14th century, the court language of England was French. That's wild. That's wild uh, to it, think about. Yeah, um, but ultimately, um, I don't, well, there's an expression that when looking at um, England in the high medieval period, so sort of 
post Norman conquest till about the middle of the 13th century um, is that the kings of England were just um, French nobility who happened to also be kings of England, if that makes sense. Although I would, I would question if William was really was really French. I mean, if you look at his look at his ancestry, it was, uh, it was you know, I'm not, I'm not sure if there was any actual French blood. I'll have to look back at his family tree, but I'm I'm fairly certain. Um, um, well, uh, you're right because the Normans um, first arrive in the uh, 9th century under um, Rollo, um, the Viking, and so they're granted um, a land by um, I think it's some. Um, I'm going to get the king wrong, but I think it's um, Charles the Simple is the one who grants them land, and you know the etymology North men become Norman, no, hence Normandy. So yes, so they are these French people that have some Viking Germanic ancestry, but they're heavily Francified. That they speak French, they have fully adopted French ways of culture and, and life and French feudalism. Well, um, in the north of France, the north of France is demographically quite different from southern France as well. Um, yes, because in the south, um, they're heavily Latinized, uh, hence um, the 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 Occitan language that um still survives in some uh, in some areas to this day yeah so i'm just i'm just uh i'll pull whatever cards i need to pull to make sure that this is really a this is actually a, a germanic nordic victory this is a, this is a <laughs> rollo this is we're putting this on on rollo actually and not on the not on the french not on the frogs mm. Mm. I, I suppose that's one way of looking at it but um oh well, it was interesting that we're talking about this idea of the legacy of the Norman conquest. So, because um, for just looking back on the Anglo-Saxon period, there's been much wrestling with what what it meant. Because um, immediately afterwards, so in chronicles such as um, Geoffrey of um, Monmouth's History of the Kings of um, Britain, he's very dismissive of the Anglo-Saxon period. He sort of says, "Oh, they were they were they were backwards. They weren't really uh, civilized, um, and they." They say the true civilized um, people were the were the ancient Britons, you know, the um, people like King Arthur, who the the, the Latinized Celts, and um, that persists for a very long time into the medieval period. And it's um, it's actually interesting because then when you get to the seventeenth century, um, and you've got the conflict between Crown and Parliament, um, there's this very erroneous uh, myth where you've got. Um, I don't know if you've heard this, but there's an expression which is um, on English neck a Norman yoke, which is the idea of mm, I haven't heard the, the, uh, yes, the the English are this freedom loving lib, uh, sort of liberal people um, with their Magna Carta and their Parliament, um, you know, and all their rights and privileges were trampled by these tyrannical um, continentals who came in and. Um, and, and that somehow the civil war of the 17th century was a a return with a V to Anglo-Saxon tradition against the continental um, tyranny. Um, but that's, uh, but that quite doesn't hold up to scrutiny because, um, I mean, look at the etymology of a word like parliament, like that's French, parleur, to speak. It, the Normans brought parliament. It wasn't an Anglo-Saxon invention. And uh, as we've covered, the, uh, the Witan was an Anglo-Saxon event. So it's true, the Anglo-Saxons had, had a Witan, but that wasn't really a parliament. That was just a body of nobles to um, help govern the realm and um, manage, it, manage the, the succession. It, it was very different to, to a parliament. Yeah, so I, I've got sort of one comment and then one question to maybe get us to the end here. And the first is... Well, I'll start with the I'll start. Well, there. Okay, so there's been the claim. I don't recall who had this claim, but there there has been an idea that the English have their more liberal in the classic sense. You know, that they're more freedom loving and more individualistic tendencies. That this is a result of being an island nation and not having to and having sort of a natural barrier of the sea unlike let's say the germans who are surrounded on all sides or uh or the poles let's say and that it's, it's really this being an island nation that's allowed them to be 
more free and liberal in their attitudes and in their in their nature but as you know reading through the chronicles when i read through this it's nothing but invasions from all sides it's it's nothing but just endless fighting and beating back and trying to combat invaders so do you, what do you make of this this sort of claim that the island nation status of the English allows them to be more independent. I mean, certainly by the time you get to the empire, then you do, you do have this England is much more outward facing rather than defensive. But I do question, I do question if that, that there's, if that's actually true, that Island nation gave them that sensibility of freedom and individuality. Well, it's true to an extent, because when you're an island nation, you're, you've you got greater security from invasion. But you're right, there were invasions still. I think England's had less invasions than some other countries. And being an island, it has a level of security. So when you're that secure, you're less worried about military affairs or trying to stay stay secure. You can focus on other things. So it's, I'm not going to say it's completely wrong, but I'd say it's a combination of that. And it's a combination of, obviously, the certain elites or people who have that viewpoint seizing power and maintaining power because ironically um it was actually through an invasion of england uh, that of the so-called glorious revolution in the late 17th century um where um these english whigs invite um william of orange to depose james ii and establish this sort of constitutional monarchy that we that we still live under so so for, you could argue that Rather than, you know, security ma- making England liberal, this bre- lack of security, this invasion imposed on it made it liberal, you could say, mm. in a way. Oh, interesting. I, yeah, that, that's, a, that's a very interesting angle on it. And kind of my last question is just what, what do you see as being the... Because I'm I'm always I'm perpetually curious about the ethnogenesis of the English and what is how how are the English defined? Because in one sense they have this sort of Celtic, uh, Brythonic elements, and then they also have this Germanic, and then there's much dispute over the degree to which it is one or the other, and the history. I mean, it's it's a chaotic it's a chaotic warring time. So. But the English very clearly are a, a distinct people, a distinct ethnos. They have, I mean, you know, it's it, it's very clear that somehow this ethnogenesis happened. But what what do you make of, I guess, how would you describe the English, or how would you how would you define them? Okay, uh, for this, I'm going to go back on the presentation to an older map from last stream. Okay. So here, this is where we've got the um, the Saxons coming in. So we're talk, talking about ethnogenesis. So um, you know, it's true because if if you, I don't have a map, but there is one that shows like an ethnic um, m- makeup of Britain. And um, what you'll notice is is that um, a lot of people who live in the eastern part of England tend to have um, more uh, Germanic genes in them or heritage, while people in the western um, England um, or well, Wales, especially in Scotland, but in even in, like the southwest, so where um, Dumnonia is or Cornwall and Devon, or even places in, like the northwest in like um, Cumbria or Lancashire, um, or in like the West Midlands, there is actually um, a higher proportion of Celtic um, genetics and DNA there because the, those were the last places that held out against um, the Anglo Saxons. Because you can see on this map here that. Um, because of the geography, the Saxon, the Germanics come into the east first, right, and then right. over the course of the sixth and seventh centuries, they um they conquer and move and push east. Yeah, oh, it's it's certainly yeah, it's certainly fascinating. And to what extent do you think modern English do they do they kind of fit in their own third unique category between? germanic and celtic or do you do you see that as even perhaps a bit outdated of a of a model to go with mm. um ag- again that is something debatable because 
Um, Because it really depends what aspect you're talking about. Because if we're talking about language, it's interesting talking about England as being a Germanic nation because though the heritage was was Germanic, as time, England's become less and less Germanic, because I said, referring back to the French influences of, on our language, and modern English is only something like one third Germanic in origin. Uh, the majority of the English is either French or Latin, or both both Romance languages. So it's become heavily Latin, Latinized with time. And, you know, we use a Latin alphabet, as do most um, uh, Western, Western countries. So I think in terms of... So if we're talking in terms of culture, um, I think there's definitely a blend of Germanic um, slash Romance. But in terms of our ethnicity, if we're, if we're going to go with that um, angle, we're a mix of Germanic and Celtic. We're yeah, maybe a little and, bit, we're may, maybe a little bit of Latin in there from maybe Roman times. And perhaps that is kind of the that has been the the uniqueness of the English relative to the rest of the continent. That does something about it. Whatever, whatever occurred, whatever forged the English, whatever combination of, of battles and stories and, and marriage alliances and invasions and migrations that we're talking about throughout the Chronicles, whatever happened, it, it worked. I mean, it, it led to something truly great, which I mean, you see in the, the geniuses and the artists and the, the great leaders and the the spirit that you have with the english what whatever combination of factors went into it i mean it, it did end up producing something something truly great no in, in indeed, indeed it does and um and sort of to um talk about modern times um as you probably know the uh england is not exactly in a healthy state right now but nor as much of the west right. so yeah, it is, it is my my hope that um, obviously as we if I move forward uh, to this period, you know there have been dark times in English history. There was a time where half the country was occupied by a um, um, by um, a foreign people that were hostile to us. But um, but perhaps we can return and do whatever the elder did and um, reconquer and reconstitute. Yeah, maybe maybe uh, in retrospect, Dane Law wasn't so bad. Maybe uh, maybe that's our solution. Maybe that's our hope. Is uh, I think I just need to rally some of the boys together. We come back, we reinvade England, and boom, there we go. That's our path. That's our path forward. There. No, um, I, I, mean, I joke. I joke. But that would be well. Um, well <laughs> I, I, in, in some dark, morbid way, it would be an improve. It would certainly give the North an improvement. But. Um, <laughs> Yeah, but but no, ideally, um, England should be for itself and ruled by by its own king. Right, right. No, I no, I and I I pay my compliments to England. You know, although I don't have a drop of English blood in me, I'm, you know, but my family's been in America for a long time. So to live in America and to grow up in America, it it is in some sense. For most for most Americans to be adopted or sort of raised with so much of the culture and especially the literature of the English, so I mean I I have a, a profound profound love and respect for for the English people and their history because you know so much of it is what I grew up with in the language and the writings and the stories and the legends and it's it's yeah profoundly profoundly had uh, shaped who I am and many of the people around me. Mm, it was certainly influential, I think, on a lot of the um, old stock Americans because um, the uh, the wasps, as they're called, because um, when I was doing re research for this, um, I happened to notice that there are some colleges um, in, in America that are actually named after like Alfred the Great and Edward the Elder, which I was a bit surprised about, um, actually. Yeah. But, well, it just goes to show they really um, wanted to honour the... Um, this was the, the Anglo-Saxon past. Yeah, and I'll need to visit the East Coast more because I just, you know, some part of the East Coast kind of rubs me the wrong way. I don't know if it's the, I think it might just be that there's too much of the, too much federal government power there. And it, it just kind of is off-putting to someone who's, 
got sort of a more rural Midwest culture to them. That seeing seeing that kind of uh, seeing that kind of culture power kind of rubs me the wrong way. But I I like to think that in and maybe you see it more in the South than but a lot of these kind of wasp areas, I, I'd like to think there is still a lot, uh, uh, an enormous amount of kind of thriving English spirits in in and around there. So I'll, um, I'll do some more traveling. I'll have to, I'll have to go experience some of that for myself. It's interesting that you refer to the South as English because to my, from what I recall, most a of the South, Scots Irish, said, yeah. Scots Irish, yes, exactly. Yeah. Well, I suppose it depends on where in the South, uh, because I think the old, the old sort of Dixie areas, you do have a lot of kind of English aristocracy, from what I understand, kind of that a bit of that culture. Well, well like, especially around um, Virginia. Well, like Appalachia, and... yeah. Well, like Appalachia is extremely Scots Irish, but the Scots Irish are really just Scots. They're just Ulster Scots. Apparently, they're not even Irish at all. They're just Ulster I mean, Scots. Y- yeah, that's the reason they're called Scots Irish because they are descendants of Scottish people that migrated to the plantation of Ulster in Northern Ireland, and then their descendants again migrated uh, to America. Uh, that so, makes sense. yeah, I only discovered what um, what that meant in like the past couple of years because the years I'd heard of it and I thought I never quite understood what being Scots Irish meant, but then I found out. I, and, I assumed um, it was a mix of Scots and Irish, and then they just sort of intermixed, but apparently not. Hmm. No. Okay, uh, so I think we've reached the end of the of the stream here, and um, thank you everybody for watching um, our discussion. I hope you enjoyed it. Uh, so before we wrap up, is there anything you would like to show Nord Huger? Uh, feel free to check out Nord Huger, uh, my channel. I, I post content not too dissimilar from what Hitman has, and I'll be posting some more stuff in the future. So feel free to check that out if you're if you're interested. Uh, but I just want to thank Hitman for putting all this together, this presentation. He's definitely uh, much, it's it's refreshing to be able to talk to someone who has such an in-depth knowledge on this area. Because a lot of this stuff, I only kind of have a cursory, cursory memory of or cursory knowledge of. So it's really fun to get to go so much deeper into the material. No, certainly. Because I think um, one of the rele- relevations I've made over the past couple of years is that... Um, politics is fine and all but it's kind of a waste of time it's far more important i think to read about and understand your own history because because if you don't know your own history um you, you kind of become lost as a people um like like we have been today and it has to be reclaimed indeed yeah yeah you become kind of just subject to the the winds of the time and the spirit of the age and you get kind of tossed and blown about by whatever forces are the latest trend and the latest ideas. So I, I completely agree because I used to I used to also be more into the day-to-day political issues of the of the moment and what's going on in in electoral politics. And then yeah, I, I came to the same conclusion that you know history is studying and immersing yourself in in the stories and the myths and the legends and the figures of history grounds you a lot more. Mm, I know and it really roots you as part of a, a wider community, community and the people. Oh, most um, certainly. Yeah. And that's something that people are feeling, feeling the loss or maybe they can't put their words on it. They can't, they can't pin it directly, but that is a huge part of what, what people in the modern age are are missing and yearning for. Mm, well, we, we have a, a long way to go, but um, hopefully we, we will get there. Uh, so indeed, thank indeed. you. God willing. Yeah. So thank you for everybody who, who's been, been watching. And if you have a question, uh, drop a comment below and I will do my best to answer. Uh, so in terms of this channel, uh, next Saturday, uh, or was it Friday? So I think it's Friday, sorry. Yeah, next Friday, uh, I am doing a stream I've been having to delay several times, um, but hopefully it should finally be coming ahead. Uh, I'll have be having Furious Personats back on and we will be discussing um, my reminiscences of East Africa, uh, the autobiographical work of um, 
one, Paul von Lettau Vorbeck, the uh, Dilo von Africa or the Lion of Africa and the East Africa campaign of World War One. So uh, thank you all for listening and goodbye. <laughs>